and we're on the air. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the stream. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody, wherever you may be watching, whether it's morning, noon, or night. And um, I am joined tonight, and I want to welcome the Don first. Welcome, Don. How are you Thank keeping? Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Absolutely. And we have a very special guest this evening, guys. I just want to mute this tab. We have a very special guest this evening who is the leader and the founder of the National Party, and that is Mr. Justin Barrett. Welcome to the channel, Justin. Welcome to the stream. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, very happy to be here. Yeah, uh, we're very happy to have you, actually, and we're honored. So um, I think, yeah, we should just jump straight into it. I, I would like to first say to people, if, if people would like to see an, in, an earlier interview with Justin, there's a very good one on Dave Cullen's channel. I think people should watch that. Um, but maybe we should start off by just asking, what sort of motivated you to start the National Party and um, about the national idea? Sort of those two things together are, are, are very good, because I think the national idea, I was just reading over it again today, and it's a brilliant uh, summary of what the National Party is about. And it, it's, it resonates with me in so many different ways when I read through it. Um, but it's, it, was, it was founded at the right time, and I think it couldn't have come sooner, actually. Well, it's funny, like, to, to, just for my own background, uh, when you say, like, when did it all start for you, is I don't remember it ever starting. Uh, I remember being asked uh, uh, d this question directly at one point um, by somebody is, uh, when did you become a nationalist? And it was like, what do you mean when did I become a, I, I don't understand what not being a nationalist is. I did, it's not, it's not uh, something that I thought out in some kind of ideological theorem and came to the conclusion that this was the correct ideology for me. It's something that was like in the very bone of my existence. And as soon as I was old enough to even begin to grasp the, the, the outlines of Irish history and, and Irish culture and Irish nationhood, um, I felt that I was a part of it. And a part of it in, not just in in the sense of like a part of it in the sense that I was also responsible for it. In other words, uh, it, it was part of me, I was part of it. I was responsible for my part in defending it and keeping it. Uh, now, I'm old enough to um, at least lived in the time where it didn't appear to be under that much of a risk. Um, so a lot of the things now that are considered very uh, extremist opinions would be taken for granted when I was a child. So uh, growing up as a nationalist, for example, when I was in primary school, um, the ideas that I would espouse now politically were just the, the commonplace of the syllabus even. Um, now maybe we had a particularly nationalist uh, uh, primary school teacher, but there you go. I, I just don't understand what it is not to be a nationalist because it's who I am. It's uh, and it's and it's who we are. And I think that's transferred over into the, the phrase, the national idea, because the, the phrase, the national idea is, yeah, that's coined by the National Party per se. Um, but it's not a new concept. It's not a, our concept uh, in a sense. Um, it's an idea that the Irish nation has always existed as long as, as uh, memory serves and, uh, and should exist for as, as long as the future goes forward. And so in that sense, it's not new. It's, it's, the, it's the ideology of Pierce. It's the ideology of, and as Pierce said at his graveside oration to O'Donovan Rossett, it's the ideology of Tone. It's the ideology of Emmett. It yeah. goes back uh, further than that. It's not about, it's not even about republicanism. Uh, it's not republicanism because uh, Irish nationalism has known uh, a, a time when it was monarchist under the O'Neills. Uh, it's known the Confederation of Kilkenny. It's known the 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 time of. It's not anti-British in and of itself. It it became synonymous with that because of British rule. But of course, the Irish nation goes back so much further than than British rule or, or English interference on this island that that too doesn't sum up 
the totality of what 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 it is, what it means to be Irish or what that is as an idea. And so, is, is it the constant struggle for Irish freedom? Is that to the do with concept it? in in so far as our, our Irish freedom, our, our 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 as it is now, Irish existence? the very existence of of what it means to be irish uh, either physically or culturally and and both of those two things are are under threat at the moment uh, uh, we can we can become cosmopolitanized um, without necessarily be being ethnically diversified or we can be ethnically diversified and um, and and we cease to be ireland as we 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 would know it or understand it yeah. so the national idea, that that term, the national idea, may be coined by the National Party, but there's nothing new about it. It is, it is, it is as ancient as Irish, Ireland itself. And it is simply this, is um, phrased better, far better and far poetically than me by Parry Pierce when he said, is uh, the Ireland we want is an Ireland not free merely, but Gaelic as well, not Gaelic merely, but free as well. And to surrender either one of those two would make, make the other meaningless. Uh, a, a, a political freedom for, for a state called Ireland is of no use. To me, it's of no use to my children, it's no use to my grandchildren. Uh, uh, um, being Gaelic under the heel of a foreign power well, actually, to be honest, that's preferable. That is actually preferable because we have we have we have known that before, and as awful as it was, and as terrible it was, as it was, and uh, and and the degree of suffering that our ancestors went through for to to hold on to the, the, their nationality through that, they did succeed in doing so, and so you can come out of a period of uh, shall we say political subjugation. But you cannot come out of a period of the the, the modern multicultural um, diversification process, which is both ethnic, uh, cultural, economic. Uh, it basically the the, the denationalization of 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 a country, uh, the atomization of its people into into this concept of a kind of radical individualism, um, where they have no shared common past, no shared common present, no and no shared common destiny, and that's more than anything else what the National Party is trying to sum up in the phrase the national idea. Now, but. Policy, uh, principles flow from that and policies flow from that. Um, but it is the national idea that makes that that is central and, uh, and, and, and no policy that deviates from the national idea uh, will ever be part of national party policy. And no principle that deviates from the national idea will ever be national party part of the national party principles. Everything is viewed through that lens, which is that what is good for Ireland is good for me. What is good for Ireland is good for my children. And there is no sacrifice which I will not make for my children that I will not make for Ireland, because ultimately it is the same sacrifice that I am making. I'm creating by, 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 by maintaining an Ireland that they can live in. I am defending them just as much as if I was to physically defend them from an intruder into my home tonight. And that's the way we view it. And that's, that's the way we view all policy issues, you know, no matter how small or how big they are. And you can argue over tax rates and you can argue over corporation taxes and all that kind of. OK, that's fine. That's fine. That's where that's if you like, that's where they should, the debate should be is everybody should be agreed on the national idea. Everybody who is engaged in politics in Ireland should be agreed that the Irish nation comes first. And then we'll discuss and debate what is best for the Irish nation. Yeah, everything in the interests of the Irish nation. Yeah. But, so but, like the bank bailout, that would not be done under the National Party. That's not in our interest, for it's, example. It's inconceivable for, for, uh, for to me that an Irish government sat around a table and, and decided, um, uh, let's see what we can do for the banks. 
and concluded that, well, this will cost the Irish people a lot of money. This will cost the Irish uh, nation a lot of money. This will saddle the next generation with debt, uh, but it will save the banking system of Europe from collapse. And that's our priority here. And I've just been on the phone to Jean-Claude Trichet, and he says uh, that uh, your number your number prior, one priority, lads, is to make sure that the European banking system doesn't come apart. And, um, and so it's into your laps. We want a bank guarantee. And so they sat around the table and went, yeah, a bank guarantee, because it was... The, the, the priority was the European banking system. Um, a national party government would look at that situation on that night and would say, how do we protect the deposits of uh, ordinary Irish people? They're, they're, they're like usually rather meagre savings, uh, the average Irish person. How do we protect them from, from this, this situation that the banks have gotten us into? But... That would have been the important thing is not precisely what we would have done so much as how we would have come at the question mm -hmm. and how we would have come at. Because the next time we're in such a situation, it won't exactly be precisely the same. But the same question will be before us is who matters here when like who's who matters when we're making this decision? And for us, for the National Party or for a National Party in government, if we are in power, the Irish people matter, the Irish nation matters, and we, we, we make decisions. And sometimes we'll make right ones and sometimes we'll make mistakes and we'll make right one, wrong ones. But we will always make them from that perspective. And, and we, we coined the term, the national idea, but it's, it's as old as Ireland itself. It's, it's not, I've invented nothing here and, and don't, I don't pretend to have invented anything. Yeah. Yeah, but you have re re readdressed it um, and put it back out into people's minds, something that they haven't thought about in a long time. So that's that's very good. Uh, I think it's excellent. Good. Um, Don, have you? you yeah, no, no, you've made great points there, actually. Um, I have a excellent. lot of questions, but uh, I was going to say, even it's, just, it's very refreshing to see nationalism uh, being discussed without this ideology of republicanism overriding it. That for me, that that is one of the biggest uh, things that I think the National Party is is right to be doing because Republicanism has, in my opinion, uh, ruined nationalism in this country, and it's been used for very subversive um, reasons, and it has had quite, quite frankly negative effects. That's not to disparage the people who fought for independence or what they believed in, but those people were nationalists, and there has been this this rewriting of history to uh, write in socialists, write in and and o overplay perhaps the uh the uh what exactly was going on with a lot of people who fought for irish independence and now it's become this kind of uh this kind of globalist marxist uh internationalist thing where we we're, we aren't allowed like I, I saw them there lately it's like this is saint patrick's day and they're talking about like what is irish identity and these uh they had this panel on the radio and oh, it's yeah. like over five yeah. people and and they're, you know exactly what I mean then, like they're, they're all talking about what is Irishness? What is, sure, sure, we're all, sure aren't we all Irish? Anyone that comes here is Irish. And you know, they had a, had a Muslim guy there and he's saying, well, sure, it's about tolerance. And, I, and, and I, that, the irony of that isn't lost on me. I'm sure it's not lost on you. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, they ended up, and all they can say that our, our identity revolves around is tea bags, um, you know, LGBT <laughs> issues. Yeah. And, uh, being open to the world and and this is celebrated as like a culture well the, the british prime minister would say the exact same thing today so yeah. would the prime minister of france yeah. what is irish and and they can't get down to the reality that there is essentially a blood uh relationship here this our, ireland is a big family there is uh what's called in fact uh they the ireland is the fa is a, the family grown large that's what an, an actual nation is and um Again, another weird thing that happened to me in the last few years because I was out of politics for a while, out of public life, and possibly I wasn't in the right politics anyway. I wasn't mixing in the in the best circles. But in any case, um, the um, the idea, uh, the conversation started around the table at a particular meeting I was at prior to the party being formed. It was when we were canvassing people to see who would be interested. In, in, in forming a party or forming a group uh, uh, to do something about the situation we were in. And the, the, the discussion around the room started into um, 
uh, propositional nationalism uh, or civic nationalism. And at one particular point, I said, uh, look, uh, lads, I don't mind uh, asking a stupid question um, if I get an intelligent answer. So I'm just going to put it right out there is I have no idea what you're talking about when you say propositional nationalism. I've never heard it. I've never heard the term. And it was explained to me, and you guys will be very familiar with the term civic nationalism, propositional nationalism. And I and 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 no more than when did you become a nationalist? It was like, but that's no, that's no nationalism at all. <laughs> that's like anybody. That's that's the that's the, the paper Irish as I, as as the yeah. National Party uses the phrase. The paper that's Irish the earlier yeah. version of globalism. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's what you need uh, to to get people to identify themselves on the basis of legal pieces of paper, first of all, uh, which are given out uh, at random. Um, they're not. There's not no inherent value in nationality. Then they're, that that's it's a, just a tradable commodity. Also, for example, if if nationality is citizenship, well, you can have dual citizenship, can you not? And if you can have dual citizenship, you have dual nationality. So therefore, nationality really isn't an important thing at all. Um, the Republican element is then the National Party is a Republican Party because in the early 21st century as we go forward the form of government that we would advocate for this country is is a constitutional republic now that makes us Republican but that doesn't make us um, confused. progressive yeah it doesn't first of all it doesn't make us progressive but second of all it doesn't make us confuse our nationality with republicanism uh or the idea that uh, to take Pauric pierce and see you you talk about the rewriting of irish history at one point uh Pauric pierce the the ultimate republican you might say uh uh toyed with the idea of offering the throne of ireland to a hohenzollern prince uh, uh, uh a, a german prince to draw the germans into conflict with the british because he as far as he was concerned, so long as Ireland was free, it didn't matter if there was a crown on, on somebody's head in Dublin. Um, that didn't matter. Um, so long as the crown on the head wasn't in London and the government wasn't in London, so long as the Irish people ruled themselves, that was a significant thing. So ultimately, he didn't dig his heels in on the idea that there should necessarily be a republic. And as I say, if you go if you go much further back in history, you'll actually find the, the, that Cromwell was a Republican, and uh, a, a, a Republican who came to Ireland to rout out the monarchists, the Irish monarchists of the the old clans. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were monarchists in in modern terms. So we would never confuse a form of government. Uh, the Americans do that, you know, the Constitution, the Founding Fathers, all of that, uh, what, with the idea of, of nationhood. Uh, a thinking Irish person would never confuse a, 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 their nationhood with a concept or, or like a political concept or a political construction. Whether that was conservative or whether that was liberal uh, is, is, is actually neither here nor there. Irish nationality stands one side to that. And as the Don said there, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a blood relationship. It's, it's a familial relationship. It's, um, it's, it's where we get the phrase, my country right or wrong. It's, um, you know, um, family is family. And... They, uh, and you may not particularly like everybody in your family, but they're family nonetheless, and they're 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 us, and everybody else is them, and 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 when I say everybody else is them, I don't mean we uh, that that we see that in a negative way, um, any more than we see our neighbours in a negative way, but they are them, and and as a family we are us, um. The us is what matters, if you like, not the them. Um, we don't need to hate, uh, and we don't even need to dislike uh, or, or disparage any other nation in order to realize that for us, 
as a people and for ourselves as individuals. Born Irish, the Irish blood, this is our country and we can't be of any other country. And to, to put it the other way, for example, is I could move to France. The European Union says that I, I can move to France and live there for the rest of my life. I'd never be French. Um, I may might speak French. I might, uh, uh, although I don't. Um, uh, I might learn, um, you know, what what the French national sport is. Although I don't know what it is at the moment. I just about know what the French uh, um, national anthem, uh, the tune of it, sounds like. But uh, and and their flag. But I, I know a little enough about France. But my point is this: is it still wouldn't be my nation. It still wouldn't be mine. I would, wouldn't be part of that. Their family. Now, uh, that's not to say that I don't admire the French, and that there aren't, aren't things about the French to admire, and that there aren't things in their history too that you look at and say, "Wow, that was like that was ma a magnificent achievement in its time." But it's not our achievement, uh, if you like, and it's not part of who we are. Part of we who we are is more than enough to be proud of. Um, and it is a blood relationship. It's not a political idea. It's not a, a uh, an ideology. Um, uh, republicanism is, and even republicanism could be a benign ideology or could even be a pi positive by uh, uh, ideology. And I think it can be a positive, um, but not in the hands that it has fallen into. No. And what we're talking about here specifically is we're talking about Sinn Féin, let's face it, yeah. uh, where, where there, are, there are splinter groups like Republican Sinn Féin and so on and so forth. But essentially we're talking about Sinn Féin when we're talking about this malign and malignant and malicious republicanism, uh, which uh, deliberately seeks to disassociate itself from the nation. Yeah. And uh, as Mary Lou MacDonald said quite recently, we are Irish Republicans and internationalists. Yeah, it's like a mutation of nationalism. That's so, why I see Sinn Féin. So it's uh, because... Because uh, Irish nationalism has expressed itself in a Republican way pretty much uh, from the flight of the Earls onwards, or, or sometime after that anyway, certainly um, from the time of Wolf Tone and, and Emmett, uh, then because of that, we, it's very easy to mistake the two for the same thing. And, uh, and a lot of people have done so. And the... The Sinn Féin has most definitely used what I would call the emotional draw, the 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 the, the almost primordial drag, the intuition, uh, all of us to the nation, mm. and used that and and abused that to push an agenda which is internationalist, which is globalist, and which is frankly, if it if it wasn't even just globalist and internationalist, it's straight down perverse. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it is literally a sickening ideology. It may be the ruling ideology of the day, and therefore I might, might be a, it might be a standout thing for me to say. Um, but it's, it, it is perverse. It's, it's, it's bizarre. It, 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 it literally, um, it, do, it doesn't make sense, even anti-Irish. It's anti-Irish, but it doesn't. It doesn't even make sense in and of itself. I mean, you know, they they, they don't know what they, they they don't know what they believe in anymore. They're now attack like they're now attacking. For example, the transgenders are attacking the radical feminists because they won't accept that uh, that trans women are really women and trans men are really men. And so now you've got the the far left of feminism in a in a rabid struggle with the far left of transgenderism over what constitutes a biological fact. And this is, yeah. this is, this is, this is now no longer a political so much as it is a psychiatric question. <laughs> it got to the point sure. where it's a psychiatric question, but it's been, it's become politically mainstream and it's become um, unchallengeable. And it's uh, a, 
even are, though these are tiny little minority groups, this LGBT, it's a tiny little group, but they have so much money and influence. Is it because of all the NGOs and the, in, the foreign uh, international influence that, that pushes them forward and, and the, the, the finance that they get? Because like, they only represent a tiny fraction of people, really. It's certainly uh, what there's a lot of international money there. There's an awful lot of international money there. But I think what a lot of a lot of Irish people are unaware of, uh, which is more striking, because it's it's easy to, for example, to talk about the Soros money or Atlantic philanthropies or, or things like these as uh, uh, foreign money coming into Ireland. But in fact, uh, the NGOs in Ireland are funded to the tune of five point five billion euro a year by the Irish government, by the Irish yeah. government. Uh, overwhelmingly, the money that uh, that supports Amnesty International, the Refugee Council, the Migrant Council of Ireland, the, uh, uh, the Gay and Lesbian uh, Education Network or whatever it is, Glenn, I, I can't remember what the letters stand for exactly, but um, what's got, they'll change them anyway. <laughs> so there's, there's no point in Keep trying on. to remember these acronyms. Um, I mean, I remember again, once again, LGBTQ is a very new concept. There used to be just gay and, uh, and then it was gay and lesbian. And then it's like, it was like weeds in the backyard. It was just suddenly <laughs> every letter in the yeah. alphabet was included. And a tranny was just someone who dressed up in women's clothes like at the weekend or something. Yeah. Um, now it's a life. That, uh, it, uh, um, it was the subject uh, up until 10 years ago. It was the subject of, of Channel 4 documentaries, maybe at 3 o'clock in the morning for insomniacs, <laughs> that there were some very strange people out there who did this. But we can over, we can, we can overspeak the amount of international money that's involved and forget that there is 5.5 billion yeah. euro of Irish taxpayers' money uh, being pumped into these NGOs every year. I couldn't plus believe it. There is the Soros money, plus there is the Atlantic Philanthropies money, plus there is the, the, the foreign financing in, in, in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of forms. And then, um, and then we have this absurd situation that uh, that somehow the American election was swung to Donald Trump by some people pretending to be real people on Twitter and in fact running several accounts. And you're going like there's five they, 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 there's they, there's five point five billion euro being spent in taxpayers money on this propaganda that's been shoved down your throat every day. And you think Twitter bots are from uh, operating out of Moscow are the problem. I mean, seriously, seriously, uh, we need to catch ourselves on in that regard as to uh, as who the, as to who the enemy is, and as for, again, why one of the principles of the National Party, leading out from the national idea, is that the state should be the servant of the nation. Um, it is not at the moment. The state is actively undermining the nation in a way that would be described on an individual basis as straightforward treason. It would be aiding and abetting the enemy. Um, and that's what they are doing. But they're doing it uh, on a state level. And, and according to the quote, and I really wish I could appear very erudite now by remembering who it was who said it, but I can't, um, who said, if treason does prosper, uh, none dare call it treason. And treason is prospering in Ireland today. Uh, uh, the, the, the shift of the political system is to the far left, and they're all agreed on the basics. And uh, so much so that... Um, that now the, uh, the the argument on the left is how can we move further to the left because Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil have moved so far to the left that they've taken up all the the our space and uh, if we're to make if we're just to distinguish ourselves at all we're going to have to move even further to the left whatever the hell that actually qualifies as it's 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 a it's it's a bizarre situation but above all. We need to return to a situation where, where, um, where the state understands that its job is to protect the nation, that the people are the masters of the state and not the state the masters of the people. Yeah. And I remember 
I was I was I was before an all party rocks committee once uh, with the late Brian Lennon, the f- former finance minister, and um, and I said to him something which I thought was pretty uncontroversial, uh, and I'll say it to you now and see if you think it's very controversial. I said it is the duty of the legislature to give the people in law what they want in fact. And he said, um, he's, now, now, does that strike you as the most controversial thing you've ever heard? No. No. Well, he said, excuse me, Mr. Barrett, I have to stop you there. That's not the duty of the legislature. The duty of the legislature, if you read Mr. De Valera's constitution, is uh, to uh, draw its, the, its conclusions on a given matter and then decide whether to present them to the Irish people by referendum or not. Mm. And I said, well, okay, then, uh, uh, consider me um, consider me well schooled uh, in, 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 in the constitutional law, Mr. Lenehan. And let me come back to the point uh, in a different way, is that it should be the job of the legislature to give the people in law what they want, in fact. Mm. And he said, uh, it's on the Doyle records. You can you can check it tonight yourself. The the actual back and forth between myself and Mr. Lennon, and uh, he said, "Well, that's not the way it is under Mr. De Valera's constitution, and this is not how this committee will be run." Mm. So, in other words, he actually directly said, yeah. "The people don't matter." Um, uh, we decide we, what the referendum will be. We matter because uh, because you're not you you, Mr. Barrett. You're not a TD. I am. I matter. Uh, there are senators here. They matter. Uh, we're members of the Oireachtas. We make the decisions. You just come here and beg us for favours, basically. Mm-hmm. And and we and if you're persuasive enough, uh, or going back to the other point, if if you've brought a fat enough brown envelope, mm-hmm. and I see your jacket line is too flat for everyone <laughs> to that. Um, if you brought a fat enough brown envelope, maybe we 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 could discuss that and your opinion in the context of the fact that you've brought a lot of money with you. But if you've just brought your um, if you've just brought your Irishness with you, if you've just brought your uh, like I I'm I am of the people with you, mm. I'm afraid you'll get a poor hearing here. Was essentially what he meant, and. Uh, and they were healthier times, God help us. They were healthier times than now. They have they're, they're worse than they were uh, when he said that. But he was very straight about it. He, he said, uh, no, there, there's no real democracy in Ireland. Um, I think his attitude led to have been worse where we are now. Yeah, basically, that attitude that, that uh, we can do what we like. Um, for example, Simon Harris can get elected as a pro-life TD and become uh, the, the man who actually introduces legalized abortion. So what's the point of an election at that point if a, if a TD uh, can get elected on one agenda, whatever that agenda is, and then go turn around and do precisely the opposite? It's a, it's a, it's fa- it's a farcical situation. There has to be a kind of a rebirth, really, of democracy, of a, of a real kind. Of, we have to start again. Like in, in France, you had like multiple republics, like one started back with de Gaulle again, and it looks like there's going to be one starting now again, the way things are going in France. But like, I think we need a similar kind of a thing. We have to get back to basic principles. We have to cut cut the waste, cut the cut this um this bloated mess down, and start with with basic principles, bedrock principles, which are based on natural law, based on reality, how it actually is, not how, you know, ideologues from, you know, Marxist universities or whatever would like to see the world. And, um, you know, I, I hope, I believe the National Party is the one vehicle which could probably do something like that. Um, because I, I think you have a, you have a more, re, you have, you have a realistic understanding of what uh, Ireland was meant to be at the start. And you, you have a direction, which I think is very admirable. You know, it's, you're, you're very honest in what you're saying. You're, you're not saying things are going to be easy. Um, you're saying that there are hard times ahead. Like I've seen, and I've seen most of your YouTube content from your your meetings, and your, your your videos, and uh, a lot of your members speak very honestly about you. I think you re- recently you you said yourself that we have to basically be honest with with the public again because they're living in a kind of a, a maze of, of of disinformation and 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 just wishy washy half truth, and they yeah. they've lost touch with reality. Because in, in reality, I think, and I agree, and you you think so too, that the country is headed for a massive calamity. 
and um uh, we don't actually have anyone placed in a position to actually do something about this when this comes again because it will come very soon most likely the way we're setting up with the european union with the way things are going with the with the it, the italians could leave the european union the currency could collapse and, and and even the social consequences of what's going on with this lgbt mania in schools this is this is damaging generations of children we're talking about chil you know children being castrated by their parents for Christ's sake i mean this is this is lunacy you know yeah, I, so, uh, I, uh, and 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 um, what's got both literally and metaphorically in the sense that um there's one thing, uh, you know, there's a, the, the phrase is uh, the, sometimes when you see something really gross is that's something you can never unsee. Um, you can never give a child back his, his or her innocence once it's taken away. Um, there's, there's this relatively short period of time in a child's life where he doesn't believe or he or she doesn't believe hopefully that it has any enemies um it believes that it has a father and mother who who love them and and care for them and always want what's best for them and in general they have a concept of bad bad people in a cartoonish kind of way uh perhaps um you know uh but but no concept of evil as such and no concept of, of perversity as such and that's a very precious period of time in in a child's life and god knows i wish i had it back <laughs> i remember uh, like losing it piece by piece as you do and it's simple things first but um but what they're proposing to teach irish children in the primary schools is even even just on the idea that somebody that young should be if there was nothing wrong with the thing itself that they should be introduced to these ideas at that age would would in and of itself be questionable that that uh, uh, there is no reason why a four-year-old child for example needs to be introduced to, to sexuality of any kind uh, heterosexual, LGBT, uh, uh, homosexual, uh, tra transgender. None, none of this. None of this needs to go through a four-year-old's mind. Um, uh, they don't. They don't need to know that. That's not functional for them, and it's not good for them uh, to to be thinking like uh, or to have these ideas bouncing around their head at that age. Uh, they should have much simpler things to, to, to worry about. It steals their innocence much much earlier at a much earlier age. Like Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean uh, what's got like I've I've a I've a four year old now and um he um he has a little model uh, of uh, of um a character from a, a a TV show that he that he watches and he had a dream he had a bad nightmare the other night and he woke up screaming that uh what's got that the arm had broken on this toy. Now that hadn't happened in reality. That's his idea of a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> now that should be his idea of a nightmare, as far as I'm concerned. He's full. Uh, that's like the, his favorite toy getting destroyed should be his concept of an absolute nightmare. He shouldn't have any other. He shouldn't have any any concept that there's anything worse that can happen in his life than that. And and we rob them of this, and the state robs them of this, and um, and we have the minister for children, who has overseen the not just the abortion referendum, but has overseen let's 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 say more straightforward things like the uh, the scandals in Tusla and the and the uh, and within the the scouting federation and so forth, and she quite simply answers did you ever consider resigning and at, at, at any point and she said no why would i no sense of responsibility no sense of like well maybe i should have like it was within my department since i'm in the head of the department of children it's within my, the realm of my responsibility to to uh, to see to it as much as i can at least that the children of the nation are protected by the state um, no, she was working on the the um, values free sex education program to push in uh, uh, into the primary schools instead. 
In other words, instead of protecting children from pedophile rapists, she was grooming them, yeah. is the only way that to be des to describe it, mm -hmm. uh, to make them more amenable to uh, to pedophile rape rapists in the future. That's what the sex education program looks like to me. It's a it's a grooming manual. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's going to be taught by the state. It's going to be taught uh, by the state that this is normal behavior, and that if a child is confronted with with uh, with an adult with this this perverse view of the world, that it won't strike them as that odd. It won't be. It won't be. That. It it's, won't. Be, it won't be as weird as it is it as it ought to be. Yeah, and um, if we look at Britain, it's actually Paul Murphy, I think, and Ruth Coppinger who are putting their bill is going through the doll at the moment, this sex education bill. But if we look at Britain, we were only talking about statistics that came out about six months ago, where when it was introduced into the curriculum between 2010 and 2017, uh, the number of people who identified in the wrong body went up 4,200 percent. Now, I got this number wrong on, the, on one of the other streams. It was originally 40 people in 2010. And if you, if you look at 40 as 100 percent back then, well, if it went up 4,000 percent, that means it has jumped up to 1600 people in the space of uh, mm. seven years because the idea has been put into their minds and we can see that and they're still pushing it through this is so evil i think evil is the word for this yeah, evil is the word and and uh, well, people are slow to say that now because because we're in shall we say what might we, we might call a, a post-catholic era in this country mm. so we we are, we are nervous of using metaphysical terms mm. or or uh, or terms that might be associated normally with religious concepts but i can tell you that um there is such a thing as as evil i've encountered it in my life i have usually encountered people who are misled misguided they are the heroes in their own narrative even if perhaps they they um they what they're objectively doing is bad but i have come across people uh and um whom which well, i'll not say here or, or we'll all be sued and all i could get off them was evil e uh, evil intent evil purpose and conscious and maliciously so aware that yeah. this is going to do damage and uh and wanting that damage to occur not misled not misinformed not in any way uh, uh duped or 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 otherwise uh unknowing of the of of their actions but precisely aware yeah. and uh and evil is the is the only word to describe that especially as i say when it when it comes to children and as a as a parent myself i feel that very 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 closely because there's literally nothing i wouldn't do to protect my children uh but i'm getting to the point where i'm wondering and i think i'm not the only parent in the country is the question is starting to become what can i do to protect my children yeah. uh how can I protect my children when the state, as I said before, has not only become the enemy of the nation, but the state now turned uh, its its face towards my children and become their enemy too, and and, and sought to implant deviations of the mind. Shall we say that's the only way to describe and, it? And they know precisely uh, that this is learned behavior. This is not because the statistics would prove that anyway um a, a huge proportion of people who have this type of radical surgery uh, end up completely regretting it and then they're, they're kind of stuck um in that in that position and they're basically they have ruined their lives and it's it's essentially a big experiment and uh there's a whole agenda behind it i'm not even going to get into this but you were right i believe that it is essentially an evil thing it's a it, they know that they will wreck these young people forever yeah most by, doing, by doing this most of the most of these young people who are like uh, uh, particularly at a very early age uh, uh, identify as transgender or or something like that uh, are really they 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 may they may actually only need counseling at that point um, mm -hmm. just a little bit of counseling but um uh, they may need more serious psychiatric help but what they most definitely do not need is surgery Exactly. Yeah, uh, and when I was young, this would have been ridiculed, this sort of a thing, if it was even mentioned. But now it's accepted. And this is 
this is our whole problem. It, it, it's it, the culture needs to push back against this, but it's not. I see the, the Islamic culture in England is pushing back. They have taken their kids out of schools that are uh, pushing yeah. this stuff, but we it's haven't yet. Them. Yeah. Yeah, and um, what it's, uh, it, you see, one of the things about, uh, and I think, I think it's one of the reasons why, um, 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 not to get into the, the Islamic question too much, but I think it's one of the reasons why Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Now, one of them is demographic; they simply have large families. Although that is, in and of itself, a sign of a healthy uh, 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 people, because um, you know, if if you're if what you need them. is investing in the future yeah. and and not having children uh deliberate deliberately not having children i'm not talking about people who are infertile or or, or uh, uh for one reason or another in, or incapable of having children or just haven't met the 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 one as they say in their romantic comedies um uh, but who are who deliberately make this decision uh, to be childless have deliberately made the decision to not look forward to the next generation, and that in and of itself is a is a, maybe it's too strong a word, but I'm going to use it anyway. It's a it's a kind of a form of suicide. It's yeah. a kind of a form of saying, right, it ends with me. Uh, maybe not right now, but on my deathbed, nothing shall pass beyond beyond me. There which shall be no next generation. Now the Muslims don't have that attitude, and um, and within their own culture, um, although they have some very warped ideas, uh, they are functional ideas. Uh, and what I mean by functional is they may in they, they may lead to a great deal of cruelty. They may lead to a great deal of vicious behavior, but they are self-sustaining. Now, what, what Western culture and civilization has embarked upon with cultural Marxism is what I would say is a, 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 an ideology that is not self-sustaining, that cannot in the long run survive. If we were left alone, for example, if we were to take immigration out of the issue, if we were to just be enclosed within ourselves and we would we would eventually leave the place barren. We would eventually leave the place uninhabited anyway. Mm -hmm. And and what I say to people who who, uh, who who take the view is, well, look, demographics have nothing to do with the the issue of immigration. Is this is um, quite simply? Well, if you're going, if if we're going to vacate this island anyway by ourselves, does it matter who takes it instead of us? It, it, to, to me, it doesn't. Uh, it, that doesn't make sense. So, so cultural Marxism, or, or the the ideology which is is at the high point uh, uh, in in Ireland at the moment, is not in fact even a self sustaining ideology. Yeah. It cannot survive within itself. It is inherently self destructive. And then you get forces from the outside, what you might call, <laughs> may perhaps more twisted in in many ways mor morally speaking but healthier in that uh, in the objective sense of of forward looking yeah. um and uh, they overwhelm the the big yeah. culture that they come into and for people for a lot of very normal minded people or for a lot of very sane people in in the west uh islam does tend to offer uh, a a a way out, if you like, a, a kind of an alternative to the corruption that they see around them and the, the debauchery they see around them, and and can be very can can be very attractive in that sense, and that too is saddening because they 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 the number of converts they have in Europe is a, is a is a growing question as well as just the the the, the demographic move in terms of the numbers. Yeah, yeah. I would point out too that like this this period we're living through is not actually. If you look at classical civilization, this is actually very typical of what happens at the end of a civilization. And I would say that this is what's happening now is that this this run we've been on. Um, is basically coming to an end and what you find is you have a, an incredible rise in the amount of like homosexual activity transgenderism is really late in the process and typically what happens is then that the existing empire of which we are a kind of a vassal because essentially the, the empire we're a part of 
would be described as the Anglo-American establishment, really. Um, that is essentially after blowing itself up now, it has expanded and it is now, it, what happens is empires lose control and yep. uh, the ideology doesn't really transfer to the outskirts and essentially it is overwhelmed from forces from without mm. which flow in and that's what we are in now and it's, it seems like it's, 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 it's all, look, this is just classical history, this is what happened. This is what happened to Rome. This is what this is what happens to civilization. It is the format of civilizations. Um, we should learn from the past, I think. Yeah. Try exactly. to. And the, que the question is, but the question is, is, is are we stuck in a, in a, uh, because if we are, then Karl Marx was right. Are we stuck in historical determinism here, uh, where where it, it, things must play out the way they have repeatedly play out, played out before? And I do agree that uh, that that they have they they have played out this way before uh, in in other societies, uh, right down to. Um, uh, the concept of Roman citizenship became something you could buy. Um, so uh, it became a, a, the, the paper Roman, if you like, and uh, uh, the real Roman ceased to exist and nobody knew who was a Roman and who wasn't a Roman, except for these pieces of paper. Uh, there was no nationality, uh, shall we say, at the center of the empire anymore. Um, but do we uh, are we stuck in in a in a cycle of historical determinism, which means that Western culture, broadly speaking, and civilization must collapse in upon itself, or is it possible uh, that we can defy not the laws of gravity, but the laws of commonality, shall we say, and 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 revive ourselves? And I would suggest that. We cannot do that if we cling to the empire, if you, if you like, because the the idea of of the empire uh, are are dead. They are they are they are they they were they are an ideology. Rome was an ideology. Uh, Greece was an ideology, um, and so on and so forth. The civic nationalist ideology, and because they are in defiance of the natural law, they were bound to collapse. And it is, it is within, and I, I, you used the phrase a little, little earlier on, and I'd really like to hone on, in on, on the fact that you said that, because very few people talk about that anymore, which is, which is the natural law. That is the, the notion of a right and wrong that's imprinted upon us, not uh, by some uh, outside religious influence or by some ideology, but what we basically, as as even as animals, uh, on an animalistic level, we understand some things are right and some things are wrong. And that's the building block of the natural law. And, and the human intellect adds to that, to the point where you have perhaps a basis for, for what, what is now can only be described as a comeback because it, we've gone too far to say, like conservatism, I, I, I've, I've delivered a speech on this called the conservatism of retreat. Um, there is no further place for us to retreat to. There is nothing left to conserve. If things stay the way they are, the way they are isn't good enough anymore. Um, it might have been, I don't know, pick a days <laughs> at random in history and, and say that, that that's a time when things were fine. But things are not fine now and things can't be maintained the way they are now. So we've got to enter a period, I think, of two things. is uh, what, First of all is we need a... A, 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 a Gaelic awakening, a, a, a great, a national revival, if you, a, a national awakening, if you like, to what exactly has gone wrong in our country over more than a, a hundred years, considerably more than a hundred years, uh, but but specifically and very sharply and very quickly over the past twenty odd years, uh, and uh, and then whether we can have a revival once people are awake to what's wrong, can we have a revival out of that? Can we actually rally ourselves out of that? Now. The only positive example I can give you is that uh, at the turn of the century, uh, the, 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 the century before last, that is to say in the 19th into the 20th, is Ireland had become thoroughly anglicized. 
thoroughly anglicized to the to the point where for all intents and purposes the irish nation was culturally dead and it was revivable at that point and was revived at that point now it was a brief moment in the sun in many ways but it it helped us to survive and it helped us to reach where we are today with still the possibility of of that that comeback and so we have that example uh, uh certainly historically speaking as well but i say beware of imperial ideologies beware of beware of people who say to you i have the answer to all of the world's problems um it, you're lucky if you have the answer to your own personal problems most of the time and if you can if you can find the uh, as a group uh, the answers to uh, to national problems yeah. well and good um uh, but for example the national party doesn't look we had the, we, we admired the advances of of populist parties across Europe, nationalist parties across Europe. We often refer to them, indeed, the Visegrad countries in particular. But do we uh, do we model ourselves on them? No, we don't need to model ourselves on on anything foreign. Mm -hmm. um, um, we can we can admire them, but we are not inspired by them. We are inspired by first of all, we're inspired by what we have done ourselves as a people historically speaking and and what we can do as a people and what i would say is while i do believe that there is a faith uh which will that i do not believe that there is a faith which will fall on us no matter what we do but i do believe there is a faith that will fall upon us if we do nothing yep. and uh, and most people are in the cook do nothing mode at the moment um, they need to wake up out of that. If they do wake up, can Ireland be saved? Yes, mm. I, I, I'm, I am actually quite optimistic. Uh, now that historically might turn out to be very stupid, and maybe that'll, maybe, maybe this recording will be played sometime uh, for uh, uh, I don't know Chinese students to laugh at uh, <laughs> the end of uh, of the end of Western culture and civilization. Who was a madman on this island in they're called Ireland, who re who actually thought as late as 2019 that things could be saved. Mm -hmm. But I do believe it can be saved. Um, and and I'm devoting my the rest of my life at least to to that to that task as best as i can play my role in it and um and i try and maintain optimism um even though sometimes what you observe around you tends to get you down it does but we still we still are 81 percent of the country in the last census of the population the ethnic irish people so that is something to say like it, it's not all over it's not all lost if if we could this is what i said the other night to john waters i was thinking if we could put it in the constitution or, or have some sort of a way of enshrining that the ethnic irish people cannot go below a certain percentage and then if we can work from there and try to rebuild it back up i actually admire the way hungary is incentivizing their people to procreate uh, and try and revive their population by that way instead of taking in the migrants i think that would be something i don't like copying other countries either myself but i think that is would be something that would work here if we could if we could do it of course but we don't have the same Christian uh, ethos that Hungary do it, it's it's much more diluted here it's we're much further on than they are I would say but um I, I, I admire their migration policies as well but standing firm on refusing anything that the EU tries to bully them into doing I, I, I admire that I, I would love to see if, if we could do that be like hostile to their emigration policies and um the, the the most crucial thing though is keeping the ethnic Irish people in the demographic majority. I think this should be a, a human right of ours. If there was some uh, whale or some other thing that was scheduled to become uh, extinct, the people would be rallying all around to try and save it. But when it's an actual distinct people in a natural occurring nation, nobody wants to discuss it at all. They don't even want to define what an actual Irish person is, uh, even though it's it's written perfectly on the census what an Irish person is. They, they are an ethnic group, but um. Yeah, I I thought that you would be sort of not not that you looked up to Hungary, Rand, but that that would be a good thing to follow in the way that they refuse migration from the EU. Well, um, certainly, certainly, uh, the policy the, the, the policy the policy, policy on the national idea is uh, is that um, uh, the maximum amount of immigration into Ireland in any given year should be two thousand people. 
Uh, and now, uh, the, what we're talking about here is very skilled technocrats, people who can do jobs that, that we simply cannot do. And it's n not true to say that Irish people will not do the jobs, that, that, that old canard. Yeah. Uh, but there are some technical jobs where if we could if we could entice people with particular and peculiar skills. But we're talking about uh, like minuscule numbers. I would say 2,000 as a maximum. And even that, if it was to happen over uh, the f a full 10 years, would be 20,000. And we'd be talking about too many. At that point, we'd, we'd, we'd have 20,000 over a decade. You'd have, to, you'd have to talk about pulling it back. But you, you set a certain quote on a, a certain upper quote on it. The second thing we need to do is we need to get rid of, and I mean rid of, the right to asylum. There is no such thing as the right to asylum. Uh, this is our country, and if we allow you to come in here as a people, you do not come in here as of right. You come in here as of permission. And so instead of handing out the right to asylum, we should, in very, very rare instances, uh, we should perhaps be handing out permission to remain. And when I say permission to remain is the, 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 the central claim of an asylum seeker is that there's a political uh, situation in the country in which she or she, he or she has left, which would put their lives in danger if they, uh, if they were to return to their home country while that situation exists. Now, where granting asylum uh, status as opposed to granting permission to remain uh, uh, differs is permission to remain lasts as long as those political conditions last. Mm -hmm. It doesn't last any longer than that. And the assumption in giving somebody asylum uh, or, as I call it, permission to remain in very limited numbers is that they are going home at some point. That is the assumption. The moment you're granted it, you are going home. You have to get rid I of would, the idea that you just are point, just, just point out, uh, the general population. I just point out you're actually dead right because like this is exactly what most of the rest of the world does. You know, they don't like uh, people go from Ireland to places like Bahrain or or uh, or even, even all over the world actually in Asia and and these places and they don't get citizenship automatically. Yeah. You know, you're not handed citizenship. You're not, you know, they uh, they uh, give you a, a preferential tax arrangement and they say, thanks for coming. And uh, we appreciate it. And uh, but you're definitely not getting citizenship. You you're know, that, going that's home. a ridiculous idea. Yeah. And at some point, you, at some point you go home. Now, the, the what I would prefer uh, rather than I've, I've looked at the Hungarian model for 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 pronatalism, as it's called. And um I'm not a particular fan of it for 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 a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that there's a there's a there's a tax free like allowance per woman who, uh, um, to the point where she pays no tax if she has four more children. Uh, the difficulty with that is that four more children uh, is a full time job in and of itself. That's what I was thinking as well. <laughs> yeah. And it strikes me as she, that, that the woman in that situation is not going to be in a position to to have the advantage of of uh, of getting any tax free allowances in the first instance so i'm not sure if i'm not sure if they're playing a little bit politically correct there in trying to say uh well we, we don't want to say something that sounds too unfeminist um what i would suggest straight okay. off the bat is that uh, and let's be really old-fashioned about this is that we give an, a marriage loan and a marriage loan should be enough at least to uh, qualify uh, for the, the deposit on a, on a home. Yeah. And um, it should be interest free. And uh, a quarter of it uh, should be discounted with the birth of each child. So in other words, uh, if a family, um, if a man and woman come together, get, they get married, uh, uh, the state essentially hands them the means uh, on loan uh, to get a deposit on a house and get their lives started. If they have four or more children, they do not pay back that loan. They are they are they are considered to have, shall we say, compensated the nation, if you like, by by giving us the next generation. And um, 
And would that result in more stay-at-home mothers? I think it would. Yes, it would result in more stay-at-home mothers. And I think the fact of the matter is, is that there's a lot of women who would much prefer uh, to be at home with their children than in minimum wage jobs. And that the discourse on feminism and women's rights uh, in Ireland has been a very middle class, if not an upper middle class discourse, which has ignored ordinary people's life. Ordinary people, uh, ordinary decent working people have jobs. They don't have careers. <laughs> they don't have careers. They have jobs. And there's nothing wrong with having a job. But that's not the center of their life, not the definition of who they are. And they would never see that themselves as that way. Whereas a lot of these radical feminists who are the spokeswomen for women's rights, they're careerists. They're, uh, they're motivated by some notion of themselves. And they have, shall we say, imposed that on 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 all other women as well and said you must be like this too and there is something wrong with you if uh, for example the first of all there's something wrong with you if you if you want to have four children and second of all there's some there's definitely something wrong with you if uh, if your main priority in life is how those four children turn out uh, in life. Uh, I would say that the, the opposite is the case. Uh, that is a very healthy attitude by, by parents to make their number one priority to be how their children turn out in life and, and how, 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 what kind of people they are and, and whether they're both happy within themselves and, of course, uh, uh, contributory to society in terms of, of that, the, the happiness they spread around. Uh, as as well, and that's not just material benefits. That, that means not being juvenile delinquents, for example, which we, which you, you get from the broken family. And there's no point in pretending that you don't get it. Uh, you get the the perfect model for the well, not the perfect model for the family. That's I go a bit I go too far there. The preferred model of the family has got to be the the atomic family, as it's referred to. The one Ma that works married to each other uh, uh, and their children biologically born to them uh, and they stay together forever. Now, that's not always possible. And there are a variety of circumstances in which that does not take place. Uh, but we always, you know, when it is not ignoring the realities of life to set up an ideal and to strive towards that ideal in the full recognition that it will not always be reached and uh, and that uh, uh, you know allow it to come up short allow yourself to come up short the closer you get to that the the better things get for for the child and for children uh, and the farther away you get from that uh, the worse things get uh, uh, for the child and and for their for their general upbringing, and 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 children need to be real in a real sense because I mean it's such a cliche now that it's almost rainbows and unicorns itself to say it, but children are, their children are our future. And um, and if they are raised in this twisted society uh, that we that, that 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 we are creating, then then they're they're in they're in big trouble. The next generation is in big trouble. So that's what I would suggest is the uh, as the model for helping uh, pro natalist policies is that um, we need to do something about we need to do something about the housing market. Again, the perspective is what's good for the nation, not what's good for the banks, not what's good for investment. Increased GDP is of no use to anybody if it's lower per capita, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, n a number of questions come up under that area, but specifically that we could have a marriage loan that does not have to be that uh, uh, only three quarters have to be re has to be repaid after the birth of the first child only uh, half has to be repaid after the birth of the second child and after the birth of the first child of the fourth child it's simply written off and um, and the the couple get on with just paying the 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 rest of the debt and, and buying out their home, owning their own home and, and having their own future. And that, that's that's a model that I would that 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 I would like to see introduced into Ireland. And I think it's 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 
while I admire what the Hungarians have done, I see some flaws in it. And I think that what, what I've just suggested there is what we would advocate and would be a better idea. Um, but traditional values in general, which are scorned at the moment, uh, are the bedrock of the natural law and the bedrock, therefore, of national recovery. And one of the basics of that, to come all the way around in a circle to where I began, is the idea that we have a duty to one another, and we have a duty to one another because we are a nation. We don't have a duty to one another because we're just random people who have been thrown together on an, on an island on the edge of the Atlantic by some accident. We have a duty to one another to protect each other because we are one blood, one nation, and, uh, and our future lies together. We, we, we either prosper together or we'll all die together. But, the, uh, but whatever we do, we will do it together. And uh, this this diversified multicultural mess mush mash uh, ends up in in just a, a McDonaldization of of the world, and it's very bland. There's nothing colourful or diversified about it at all. It is a very 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 bland future that they have planned for us. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's an it's an ant hill essentially. Of non-identity and uh, and worker ants, uh, consumers and producers. I think our children. I think my children deserve better than that. I think your children deserve better than that. I think the children of the uh, of all the Irish people deserve better than that. And the National Party, in so far as it's working politically, is working to ensure that that is the future. Because it's certainly not the future unless we do something, unless something radically changes. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, if we had a proper culture, we might not have to incentivize people uh, if the culture was healthier. But yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. That would be a great policy, actually. And everything Hungary does wouldn't be um, suitable for Ireland, of course. It's the same with every, with the economics as well. It just everything that they do wouldn't apply to us. But yeah, I, I thought that was an excellent answer. I, I'll pass it to the Don. Oh yeah, well, I've actually got a, a good few questions, but the conversation is, is so good. I don't want to be interrupting. Um, uh, you're making very good points. Uh, someone in the chat actually, since we're on economics, um, someone in the chat was talking about your opinions on uh, uh, on um, uh, econ economic nationalism, and it ties into what I was going to ask you as well um, regarding that, particularly regarding uh, foreign direct investment in Ireland. Uh, are we too reliant on it? I think we are uh, for multinationals to bring jobs here and to well to basically pump up GDP numbers. Um, how can we get kind of get off of this uh, this supplementary income? Because a lot of economists, even very liberal ones, have actually warned that we are heading into a position where we're actually potentially going to lose, a, a, we could lose a lot of this uh, over the coming years, particularly if America kind of takes off and and brings back a lot of these companies within with tax in incentives and what have you. Um, how would the National Party deal with this moving forward? And should we have a a dedicated strategy to kind of prepare? Well, the answer uh, is directly is quite simply, yes, we should. Um, there's no question about here, 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 here we go back to something like kind of fundamental in economics uh, is that uh, which really shouldn't be argued over as such, but it's not the sum total of, of what comes in under the heading of what should be done. And, uh, and what I say, what shouldn't be argued over is that the absolute free market is the most efficient uh, uh, application of resources within an economic system. Now, uh, that is not the same thing, and people mistake it for it, uh, is, is the same thing as saying that's what we should do. Is it the most efficient way to apply economic resources? It is. Uh, but it's not necessarily uh, the most humane way, and it's not necessarily the, the way that's of most benefit to people. And um, so we have to keep in mind that uh, the free market is, is efficient. So that's a good. So we started with that. We start with the idea that the free market is a good thing. Um, and we keep the market as free as possible and we keep it as productive as possible. And so we try and keep state socialism out of it as much as possible. We try and keep regulation uh, out of it as much as possible. Uh, and we also try and keep monopoly capitalism 
out of it as much as possible because it ends up having the same result, which is that there isn't actually a free market. But again, the nation comes first. And uh, the Ireland's relationship, particularly with foreign direct investment, has can only be described as being very similar to a heroin addict, um, except that we don't get that many highs. But by God, we we we've gone through some hell of a detox every now and again. Um, and something has to be done to reorientate uh, the economy more towards indigenous industry and more towards creating an in, in indigenous market that is not uh, focused either on foreign direct investment or, in, uh, uh, or that as much export led as, as it is. But a lot of uh, uh, foreign direct investment, for example, is, is, is fake. It's like it's literally fake. It's uh, it's money. It's running money through the books, and this idea, for example, that the twelve. Hold on a second, Justin. We just lost you there. Yeah, we lost you there for a second. Can you hear us now? No, he. Can. Hang on a second. I think. If you can hear us, Justin, maybe you will have to just hang up and come back in through the link. Now, it might come back in a second itself. You could press the camera on and off, but you're frozen. Um, Let me see now. Now, this is, this is a glitch that happens in Hangouts. There's, there's no panic here at all. If, if the worst comes to the worst, he could hang up and come back in through the link. Um, yeah. Or we could... I, I'll try presenting them and then I'll present them, see what that sort of sorted out. But I don't think it will. Um, yeah. No, it won't. But... Um, I'm actually going to, I'll, I'll send an email. I think if Justin presses F5, it'll refresh. I think that should get the uh, same thing. Okay. Um, maybe he can't hear us though. Um, yeah, maybe he can't hear us. That's, that's the thing. So I'm, ju I'm just going to send the link back through the email again and just say um, rejoin if you have left, if he has... Yeah, he has. Oh, yeah, he is. He's dropped out. Maybe he heard us, Don, because he's dropped out there. If he comes back in through the link, we can pick it up there. Um, where we left off. What? Yeah, he was making. He was in a mid floor there. Um, mid floor, yeah. We we're talking about front investment. Anyway, lads, yeah, I hope you're enjoying the stream. Um, yeah. I think the conversation has been great. We have a couple of more questions each of us to get through as well. But um, yeah, I was going to go on to the censorship and how they're been censored and how unfair it is. Like just because they're different than all the other parties who are the same and agree on everything. And a, a few other questions as well. Ideas just to put out there. But yeah, um, I'm going to actually send an email now just to just to make sure. No. This is Google Hangouts. Um, it's nobody's fault. It's just the way it works. Sometimes the internet can go. Sometimes the bandwidth can be too narrow. It can come back. It's just, it's just the way it is. Yeah, that could be actually an, an internet issue as well. Uh, it could have maybe cut out or something. Yeah. I'm just going to send the link back here now. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. How is everyone in the chat going? I see all the regulars there anyway. It's good to see you, lads. Thanks for tuning in. We hit 300 there tonight. It was very... Uh, That's very massive. Good. Did we? Yeah, 300. Making channel, yeah. yeah. Oh, we're it's back, huge. Justin. Am I back? Yes. yes. We're back. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. <laughs> no, it's Google Hangouts. It can be glitchy. It's nobody's fault. It's just the way it is. But you're in mid floor there. That's the that was yeah. the only thing. Um, I, I don't know. What, I don't know at what point I stopped um, being audible. Uh, yeah. So uh, I don't want to repeat myself too much. Um, it would, we're just saying about we were talking about foreign direct investment, and you have basically we have to get off of this drug essentially uh, to uh, in order to kind of and encourage an indigenous economy uh, that yeah. isn't as export led perhaps. 
uh, well, uh, in particular, I like there's the, the the absolute holy cow of of Irish economic uh, analysis is that the twelve point five percent corporation tax rate is uh, the sole reason why the economy is afloat at all, and that if if anything were to happen to it, then then would be utterly destroyed. Now. That should worry a government anyway. If if a, if a, if a particular tax rate is the sole reason why the economy is afloat, then there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Um, for example, the the corporation tax in Germany is thirty five percent, and their economy is booming. Now, uh, if you tell me the only reason that 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 Ireland's economy is booming is because we have twelve point five percent tax rate, and we don't actually charge uh, some of those companies that full twelve point five percent anyway, um, then I, 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 you're talking about an economy that that is at the very least very fragile, and is bound to go through this 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 boom and bust cycle on a fairly like repetitive and, and fairly rapid basis. But how much of the Irish economy, for, there's, two, two, there's two questions. How, many, how much of the Irish economy as is measured is real? In other words, how much of it is not just money being passed through the books to, so as low taxes can be paid upon it? And that if in fact you, um, um, if you ro ro rose the tax uh, on it, uh, the the so-called money would stop flowing through Ireland, but it wouldn't make a, a, a damn bit of difference to anybody. And there wouldn't be a single job lost because it wasn't money that was creating any jobs in the first place. Uh, the second thing is if you've got nine or ten companies in total, uh, which uh, of themselves by their if they were to pull out in the morning, they could they could literally collapse your economy. You have to have to start to ask yourself just how much political influence do those, do those companies actually have? But you can't turn around on day one, uh, for example, and just go, right, uh, this is the situation we're in, we're going to change it overnight. Uh, economies are very, economies are like oil tankers. They're very slow to turn around. But, um, but what we don't do here, uh, for example, is we don't incentivize self-employment. We don't incentivize small business. We don't uh, give uh, tax allowances uh, in the same way to uh, small employers. Um, we don't um, support the tourism industry the way that we should. Um, we basically formulate the economy entirely uh, to suit foreign direct investment. And we are locked into that mentality. And the irony is, is that we are locked into that mentality from where, where from where, what is supposed to be the, the centre-right economically, which is Fine Gael, uh, uh, neoliberalist economics. Yeah, they, they're, they're certainly um, uh, right-wing in, 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 in if neoliberalist economics is, is your measure. Uh, but uh, all the way to the, the farthest reaches of the left, who, who talk about all property is theft, but they still defend the 12.5% corporation tax rate. They still defend the banking system. They still defend the member, our membership of the euro. They still defend... Which is the, the most dangerous thing, I think. Yeah, the they, 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 they defend the fact that the, uh, that the ECB uh, sets uh, interest rates. Uh, interest rates in Europe at the moment are 0%, for example. Now, what that means in practical terms for capitalists, not for you or I, if we were, you know, us poor dumb souls going into a bank looking for a loan to buy a car, or for that matter, if we were ambitious enough to buy a house, and uh, um, but our generation, uh, uh, if we haven't got on the property ladder by now, um, again, something radically is going to have to change if, if, that, if we're going to ever do so. But... Um, the interest rates from the ECB to capitalists, to, to the banks, to the, to the banking system, is now 0%. Now, that's, that's what they call in economic terms is free money, mm -hmm. is that you can borrow that uh, and you can invest it in pretty much anything and it's almost impossible to lose. So, uh, so what you get is you get a credit bubble. 
uh, inevitably what you get is a credit bubble. Now, what's the idea of low interest rates from the from the central bank? Well, it's to boost uh, economies that are in recession or might be going into recession. Now, uh, there's an argument for that. I don't know if there's ever an argument for 0% interest rates, but there's an argument for, uh, for lower interest rates in order to... Um, to invigorate uh, a, a sluggish economy. But the problem with a, a, a association as big as the European Union is that economies are going to be performing at different rates and at different like speeds and at different levels. And the interest rate that is suitable for one country is not going to be the interest rate that's suitable for another. The interest rate, the, the, the value of the currency, for example, that's suitable for one country is not going to be suitable for another. It's not going to be productive for that other country. And um, I remember being accused once is uh, well, uh, uh, during an interview, so some pro europhile said to me he says you're never happy with what the european uh, interest rate is or what the value of the euro is you always think it's either too high or too low and i said that's because it is it's, it's very rarely is it bang on the mark because it can't be because when when decisions are being made on what to set the interest rates at uh, the, it's the effect of on the whole eurozone that's taken into account. Now, that's to take out any malicious intent by bankers, by the way. To take out any malicious intent, they have to take, factor in what is for the benefit of the entire Euro Eurozone. Now, is that likely to be of benefit to an island offshore uh, um, from, from the European mainland um, uh, in the, shall we say, st stretching out into the Atlantic? Um, rarely is the answer. Uh, is the value of the euro as it's traded on the uh, uh, the stock markets? Is that going to be the right value to um, for our economy for exports and imports? Um, um, very rarely is it going to be because it's going to be set uh, 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 for the economies of other countries. So I would say priority one. Priority one would would be to get out of the European uh, uh, um, currency, single currency zone, that uh, and restore uh, economic sovereignty in terms of uh, the value of the currency and the interest rates that are set by the central bank. These are two central uh, core instruments by which an economy can, is is controlled and therefore by which economic sovereignty can be determined and then you can start to look at as how you incentivize uh indigenous industry as opposed to foreign direct investment yeah. but again putting it through the the periscope of the national idea uh the priority must be to not uh, to to have indigenous growth because indigenous economic growth is secure growth. It's it, it's job growth that just won't up and leave overnight. It's job growth that doesn't panic. It's job growth that that doesn't uh, um, in in a downturn uh, doesn't up sticks and, and move to Bangladesh or wherever, um, or for that matter, even not in a downturn, just because the Bangladeshi government uh, offers them a particularly good deal because if 12.5 percent is how, what you're depending on to attract foreign direct investment somebody's going to come along with 12 percent or 11 and a half percent and if that's all you've got going for you then there's something seriously seriously wrong with how you how you're organizing your your economic uh, uh future so i'm not advising a return and this is very important because if i if i don't say it i'll be accused of it is i'm not uh, 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 advocating a return to protectionism i'm not advocating a return to de valera's uh, like autarkist cut off island situation i'm advocating the 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 freest uh, 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 movement of the free market in goods that is possible within the national interest but the common good the common good must supersede the individual good and certainly the individual corporate good every single time 
but the economic model that why we we would favor is certainly free productive enterprise uh we we're not socialists we are far 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 from socialists and we don't mind the term right wing if 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 the person using the term right wing understands what we mean by that um we are for the free market we are for private ownership we are for private property uh, but one of the things that we are having now is we are creating a socialist state by by regulation. In other words, the vast majority of people own no private property at all. Um, so uh, so where's the where's the free enterprise in that? The the vast majority of people are uh, they, they, I've heard the phrase used wage slaves, and and that in practical terms is is essentially what they are. They. They get up at six o'clock in the morning. The people that, that, that Leo cares about so much, they get up early in the morning. They get up at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, uh, they, they, they have a two hour commute to their job in Dublin. They're not paid for that two hours. They, they have to like get ready for work and everything. So that's part of their time before they get to work. They're paid from nine till five. And then they have three hours listening to bloody Matt Cooper on the way home, <laughs> telling them how great things are and uh, what's gotten the only people who have any problems in this country are people who live in direct provision or happen to identify as LGBTQ. But yeah. you, poor sap, stuck in commuter traffic, six hours a day just driving to a job that only barely pays you the wages that allow you to survive, never mind ever owning a property of your own, or even sometimes even paying the rent on the property that you actually live in, you're just fine because you know what you have? You've got white privilege. Did you not realize that? I see that to sneak it in now. All right, this white privilege thing. Yeah, that's they're trying to apply that here as well, this cultural exactly. Marxist thing. Well, if the one thing is that Irish people have never suffered from is privilege of any kind. Exactly. Um, a certain section uh, uh, of the population who lived in Ireland, shall we say, um and 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 to be honest they weren't really irish either and most of them lived in london uh the the landlord class shall we say historically speaking uh, and and we have our own landlord class now too who live abroad uh and come home and lecture us every so often. some of them are in the doll <laughs> some of them are in the doll some but some of them are some of them are think they're international superstars like Bono, for example yeah. who lectures us on the importance of uh of being progressive uh from from uh his uh, tax haven abroad where where he makes no contribution at all and so on and so forth so, hard to stomach him. so we, yeah, he's very, he's, he was hard to stomach before he was famous. So I don't mm. like. I yeah, thought that too. God help us, uh, what's called the, 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 the state he's in now. But the fact is um, that these people, uh, uh, the average Irish person, the average Irish person is just making do. And uh, and we are told, and this is and this is why it really kicked back at them in 2016, when 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 Fine Gael put up the posters, uh, keep the economy, keep the recovery going, and people people had to read this mm -hmm. in their three-hour commuter traffic. Uh, I think if you didn't sit in commuter traffic listening to three hours of Matt Cooper, no one would believe that. But I think, yeah. I think we were mentioning this before we went on. It's just this idea that, that people are, are constantly assailed with this gibberish on a daily basis actually has a serious effect on what they believe. And people who ordinarily would actually question a lot of this and would be critical of it actually haven't got the, uh, the ability to actually reference their own opinions anymore. And they're just repeating garbage that they hear in the media. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, uh, well, and um, and sometimes self-contradictory uh, garbage that they're hearing on the media, but um, but it no longer has to fit together uh, in a coherent whole uh, 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 or or any holistic way. It's just a set of individual opinions or, that you're expected to have, and if you don't have them, you're you're automatically a bad person. Um, uh, whether you're defined as far right or whatever, but you're certainly not sending out the right virtue signals. And um, and every day, as you 
travel to and from work. Uh, uh, you get it in the morning, you get it in the evening from whatever. I only ever, maybe the people who listen to uh, uh, music radio are better off. I don't know. Uh, I always listen to talk radio, so I'm, I'm, I'm stuck with the gibbering idiots. But uh, is, um, uh, I uh, like, it, it's there day in day out telling people who are who 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 basically whose lives are are objectively miserable now i'm not saying they are necessarily because they may have happy families they may have good relationships they may have uh they may love their wives and their children and so on and so forth they know something's wrong though they know something's wrong they just don't have the language the intuition is telling them something is not right i used to be like this myself but i couldn't articulate what it was until I looked into it so much, and I think that's how the average person is as well. I think that is, uh, watch God. I think I think he uh, and she have convinced themselves that this is the way things are, and there is no other way for them to be. Mm. And uh, watch God. And the classic is, you're lucky to have a job at all. Exactly. And or what can I do on my own or something? This. Uh, watch God. Well, if you're if you're if you're falling into bed, which you will which you will be if you're if you've got like a six hour commute and a full day's job, if you're falling into bed at eleven o'clock at night, uh, only to wake again at six the following morning to start the process again, that's a hamster on a wheel. That is no that is no there's no humanity to that. There's no humanity to that, and there's no life to that, and there's no purpose to an economy that's geared to providing lives like that for the vast majority of its people. Um, that's, but do the GDP figures go up if you run an economy that way? Yeah, they do. They do. They and the house prices, of course. And it's the crucial. house prices, which makes life even more miserable, uh, unless you actually already own a house. If you, if you, if you, um, what's got? And there has been a, in that sense, there's been a gigantic transfer of wealth from, um, from, from the. Well, I hate to use class as terms, but from the working class, and by the working class, I don't mean the proletariat in the Marxist sense. I I mean the people who work uh, for their money, as the people, as opposed to the people who speculate for their money. Is uh, there's been a huge transfer of wealth twice now? It happened between two thousand and two thousand and eight, and it's happening again now uh, uh, between the people who actually go out and work every day and the people who sit on property. And um, and and when when uh, it all comes crashing down again, we'll be told uh, once again they'll all sit around the table with the bank guarantee, and they'll go, "Oh, too big to fail, too big to fail." Uh, what's God? It's getting to the point where we ought to realise that with some of these banks, uh, with some of these, and this is why this is an indicator of why, for example, I'm not. Um, I'm not, uh, um, shall we say, a prisoner to right-wing ideology. What should have been done in, in 2008 is Bank of Ireland, Allied Irish Bank, Irish Permanent, and so on, they should simply have been allowed to fail. The money that was put into the Irish banking system should have been put into a state bank. Oh, my God, did he just say something as left-wing as that? Was that just embarrassed that said that? Better well, giving it away. That's what should have happened. That would have protected the deposits of ordinary Irish, uh, like savers who have who have like relatively small savings, not multi-million dollar corporations. Yeah, they would have lost. The bondholders would have lost big time. The 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 investors, uh, like you know, in in the European banking system, they would, they would have shrieked for a few weeks, but then they would have had to move on. They would have had to move on. And that would have been what we are told is the free market. But capitalism is something else entirely. Capitalism is where the state makes sure that capital never fails. And um, um, what we have to realize is that we, we now have a, a scenario with, with, with the European Union and, and with organizations like this is where far from being too big to fail, uh, they are too big to succeed. They, they they cannot in the long run succeed. They their size is so, so gargantuan, and the disconnection between the ordinary person at the bottom and uh, say the 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 European Commission at the top is so great that the capacity to understand 
the capacity for the person at the bottom to to uh, to do to exercise any influence and the per capacity of the people at the very top to have any understanding of the problems of the people at the bottom is so disjointed that without malicious intent and you wouldn't need malicious intent but mind you there's heaps of it <laughs> there's heaps of malicious intent there and we saw that throughout the, the brexit negotiations for example um uh, uh malicious intent directed uh from the center of, uh, 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 in brussels but even without malicious intent it would still be too big to function uh, uh, in any kind of a fair and, and a proper manner. And we are, we are headed, I, I would say, I would be astonished if we are not in the last two years uh, of another um, uh, like housing bubble collapse. And, uh, and a hard Brexit may be, may be the thing that pushes it over the edge. Uh, which means that it may happen, it may start to happen at the end of this month. We're on the 17th of March. If there's a hard Brexit on March the 29th, then that could be the beginning of the unravelling of the Irish economy uh, as it's currently modelled and consequently the, the, the property bubble that we have created once again. Um, uh, house prices are, are are vastly overinflated, and uh, and they will they will come crashing down because the tech companies uh, on which the 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 overrated house pricing is based largely this time it's largely based on that this time rather than cheap borrowing rates to an extent to which that's the case, but I think it's it's the reliance on tech companies and it is. I was just going to say that I think people are getting it harder to get mortgages now than back then. So it must be the reliance on the tech companies. Yeah. And, and internationally, that's happening as well. There is a kind of a credit dry up happening uh, in many countries. The property market in Australia is going down significantly as well. Yeah. So I see, um, um, you know, what's going to happen on March the 29th? Uh, an extension of Article 50, an extension of Article 50 for what? For a second referendum? You know, the, the only way, the only way Britain is getting an extension to Article 50 on uh, for March the 29th is if they if they say they're going to uh, organize a second referendum. That's terrible. That's uh, that defeats the whole purpose. Sure. That defeats the whole purpose of democracy. But from yeah. our point of view, we're caught between a rock and a hard place because um, because we can't afford to leave the European Union because our economy is not geared. To leave the European Union just immediately, uh, and, and we're not geared to have the Europe. We're not geared to have Britain leave uh, either. I don't think we'd win a referendum on leaving either. The people wouldn't just go for it yet. Uh, they're, they're still too comfortable. I, I think not remotely. Not remotely. And and it's not just that they're too comfortable. Is that they they afraid they, of the unknown? Maybe afraid of the unknown. Yeah, exactly. That's. Mm. that's Point. Better the devil we know, sort of the, the way they voted in one of the two big parties in 2011. That sort of mentality. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, it's great. It's yeah. It's great. It's great to hear your idea though, on the um, trying to incentivize our people to procreate. These ideas that you um, put across there, just and I think these are excellent. And the way you are conscious of our indigenous indigenous economy and how we are relying on this foreign direct investment. I think this was. This was great the way you put these points across. But I was just going to ask you about something else. And I, I hate to change the discussion, but I'm conscious of the time. I am, and I, I just don't want to run it over too long or anything. But it, um, the next thing I was going to ask you about is censorship, because it is absolutely unbelievable that you have all these healthy opinions on all of these economic policies, on policies to do with the Irish people. And the Irish people don't realize, I don't think, how much everything to do with these principles that you have are in their interests. And you don't get a fair crack of the whip at all when it comes to the media. I don't see the National Party on the media much at all. And is is this because all the political parties that are there now are all in favour of the same things? They're all in agreement with globalism. They're all in agreement with migration, Ireland 2040, all of these things, even the re abortion referendum, they're all in agreement. And they, are, they feel threatened by you, I think. But there is actually an example of this in Britain, if we look over there. I... I um, I noticed that like UKIP were given a lot of the spotlight um, and it was taken off other nationalist movements that would have maybe made a difference back around 10 years ago. And I think this is what could be is doing is happening in Ireland now that these nationalist not nationalist light movements are getting a lot of media time and the National Party aren't getting any. What do you think about that? And uh, how can we circumvent this? I know we will use the Internet as much as possible, but um, 
it, it's it's just it's, it's it's so unfair i think and it just shows how how rotten to the core our media actually are and they have no interest in in irish interests or the irish people but um yeah you're heavily heavily censored you are i think well um, like I can tell you that um, before, in my last incarnation in politics, as it were, which is like you know, considerably more than a decade ago now, is I had no difficulty uh, getting on radio or television or um, you know I was a regular, regular part of the commentary. As you should were. be. Um, well, as I should be, I don't know because I stopped doing it. And I tell you why I stopped doing it is because um, there was no organization behind me. And I felt I was venting frustrations on behalf of people that was leading nowhere. And that the system was quite happy to have me on yeah. radio and television. For precisely that reason, because whatever I said or whatever, now no matter how much sense it made, it didn't make any difference because it didn't go anywhere organizationally speaking. People would nod and go, yeah, yeah. But we're like, who do you, where do you go to join, for example? Um, how do you get involved? How do we support the ideas that we've just heard uh, in, in a practical political way? And um, so I was I was allowed on in around about 2006. I said to myself, do you know something? Uh, well, and I, at that time, I was appealing to a, an older conservative audience, um, the conservatism of retreat, as I call it, the conservatives who were who were at the time where I, I was trying to explain to them the need to to for a broader attack on on the liberal encroachment than just to try and defend the one area, the right life of the unborn child, as, as, as important as that was, uh, that it was not defensible in isolation. Um, now, no one wanted to hear that on the conservative side in, in, uh, in the early 2000s. Nobody wanted to hear that. So, um, so I had no organization, but I did have access to the media. And I think the reason why I had access to the media is because they knew that I had no organization. Because uh, from 2016, after a couple of brief interviews as a result of, uh, uh, just to show what good liberals they were because, um, because uh, the the communists essentially the the, the far left the reds had, had had closed down our our opening press conference our press briefing and i was allowed on a couple of programs a couple of high profile programs and then shut down nothing and i mean absolutely nothing when i say uh, when, when your perception is very little i can tell you exactly what it is it's absolutely nothing at all um, uh, outside of local newspapers, um, uh, local radio, which I used to be on all the time, and the, seldom, seldom if ever do local radio interview anymore. I've never uh, the only the only national newspaper that pays any attention to us at all is the Times, and they're more interested in uh, my personal life, which is about as scandalous now as. Um, I don't know. It's not very. <laughs> I don't know what the exact example would be exactly, but um, um, something yeah. not too controversial, anyway. No, it's not yeah. too controversial. I live a very, very bourgeois lifestyle. I can assure you, but they seem to think that uh, that uh, that there's there's great interest in that, and otherwise they they um, they they the national media in Ireland ignores us. And I think well, the reason why they do, um, and this is to a positive, is, uh, is they recognize that there is an audience there uh, for what I'm saying uh, now that wasn't there in 2004, and that I could rant away on the radio and I wasn't doing any harm because everybody was going, oh, sure, that's crank nonsense, you know? Yeah, yeah, and that yeah. uh, the ideas that I was expressing at the time have become, if they are still somewhat fringe, they are less fringe than they were. They certainly are, are considerably more widely held. And their fear is exactly as you said, critiqued in when you said that, that that people have a vague notion that something is wrong, but they, they just can't quite put their finger on it, is that if somebody was to come along and say, 
and, and put their finger on it for them and say, now, here's what you do about it. Join the National Party, get involved politically, uh, um, get these people who are currently your TDs, your senators, your, your uh, local representatives, your MEPs, uh, vote them out. And, uh, and, and that's how you shut them up. Yeah. Is um, that that would that now has an audience that re that it would resonate with, and so I take heart from that that they are afraid of me now in a way that they weren't, because I gave up in two thousand and six and I could get on RTE without any trouble in two thousand and six. Now no difficulty at all getting on prime time, and I just literally stopped, and I stopped because I realized I was I was I was part of the game. I actually consciously recognized I was part of the game. And what I did is I, I took my, uh, this this will be, the, this is a scoop for you guys, right? Because I haven't mentioned this before, is uh, I took my, my my mobile phone, which all the journalists would have had at the time, and I took the, the SIM card out of it and replaced it with a different SIM card. And uh, then nobody knew what my number was. And I just stopped getting calls and I disappeared. And if any journalist is out there watching and going, yeah, I remember that. 2006, your man was there all the time. And then suddenly, he, ne he never resigned. He never held a press conference saying he was going away. It's just one day I tried to ring him and his phone didn't answer. And it never answered after that. And then suddenly in 2016, there he was again. Right. Uh, I came back because... From meeting people from 2014, 2015, there was a younger generation coming up uh, um, who saw the world the way I saw it and the way I believe it is. Uh, uh, I didn't have to, to tell them the way it was. They had, come, they had drawn these conclusions themselves. And there was a resonance for what I was saying and therefore for what the National Party would be saying. The media knew that as well, and uh, what and any doubt that they had about that uh, disappeared with with the likes of Brexit, with the likes of the Trump election. Is they they realised they had misread the the pop the ordinary man in the street, as it were, mm -hmm. and they're not about to risk the fact that they misread the ordinary man in the street in Ireland either. Um, so uh, so it's been a blanket censorship. Uh, uh, don't don't let him say a word. Is uh, call him and call him a lunatic on Twitter if you want, but don't call him a lunatic on prime time because he's just not going to sound like a lunatic on prime time, and it's just not going to work. Um, and he's going to get an airing, and he's going to get, and the organization is going to grow, and it's just going to get worse and worse. But here's a little bit of bad news for them: is the organization, despite that censorship, uh, is growing. And, uh, and and perhaps it's growing a little bit slower than it otherwise would have. I, I don't know. But mm -hmm. maybe, again, we're getting a better quality of people because of that. And I, I'm, I'm also aware that I, I certainly am very conscious that the kind of people who are coming to the National Party to, to today are of a much higher intellectual ability and a much higher character and integrity than some of the people that I worked with politically in the past and without going through too much old history is that they are really sound young people who have the interests of Ireland and and their nation at heart. They don't ask they uh, um, what's in it for them. They don't uh, like they they, they 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 literally just all they want to do is like what can we do? They get it. Yeah. And they, they get it. Yeah, and, I know what you mean. Uh, and yes, uh, to a certain extent, we outline solutions that they hadn't thought of. Uh, but but a lot of the time, they they go, yeah, you're just putting words on thoughts that I that that I that were already there. Um, this is not. Again, as I said at the very beginning of this interview, this is not new to me. I felt this, hmm. but but the, the National Party has 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 put words to it. And has put organization to it. Yeah. And um, and so is our growth a little bit slower than it would be if we were on prime time or uh, if we were on like uh, Matt Cooper's show all the time or if we were on drive time or if we were on news talk all the time, uh, what's called 
although I can't imagine an interview between myself and Kira Kelly. I really can't because the woman is absolutely mental. But anyway, <laughs> I'll have to start an interview uh, 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 that I ever do with her with that. Is By the way, before we begin, I do understand that you're mental and that we will proceed with the conversation with that. With that under advisement that, that you were in need of psychiatric care. But but the um the fact of the matter is is that is maybe our maybe we're growing slower because we're not getting that kind of media attention, but maybe we're getting a harder core of people because it is going to be a rough, it is going to be a rough uh, uh and tumble fight as we go forward it's not going to be easy and i'm and i i'm i i am unnerved and i i'm not going to mention any names when i say this but uh you you know who i'm talking about and i know who i'm talking about and your audience know who i'm talking about who who come on even alternative media channels like this and say the problems that, that ireland have could be solved just like that all we have to do is and they have they have a one more dancer uh that yeah. would solve everything and um, if, if you don't go along with this, you, you're somehow blocking this from happening. And you're, you know, I, I've heard all of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, anybody who doesn't understand that we are in this for long haul um, is doesn't get it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, I hope, I genuinely have a deep, deep hope to see uh, in my lifetime uh, the resurrection of a proper Gaelic, a free Irish nation. But I am um, I'm not guaranteed of that, and 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 I don't wake up in the morning motivated by the by the sense that I will be that I will see it. That it just how, sounds so good to hear you saying you have that hope, though. It really does. That's how lo- that well, that's how long I think it will take. Uh, what's got? But you know, I do have, as I say, I do have children, and uh, and uh, they will see it. Yeah, they will see it. Uh, I'm. Uh, I am not. Um, I, I'm. I, I'm. I am. To, to to use the modern phrase, which again, three or four years ago, I'd be too much of an old duffer to have to have recognised. But uh, I'm not at all blackpilled by the situation as I see it. Is I think liberalism is at its high point. I think it's at its triumph moment of triumph. I think it's at its moment where it hasn't. Its consequences have not been felt yet. I think it's at a time where it can promise everything and, and it's still believable in a way that, for example, uh, um, Emmanuel Macron in France cannot promise anymore. Uh, uh, the world is going to be such a bright and beautiful place. People know now the way things are. Um, where they go f- with that is another story. But I think liberalism at its, is at its high point. I think it's finally destroyed uh, 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 re- residualist Catholicism or any hold that had, and to pretend the Catholic Church has any hold in uh, on Irish politics or Irish public life anymore is just derisory. It's delusional. It's yeah. derisory. Yeah, They're absolutely. still trying to pretend it, but it's it's just simply yeah. not true. And they need horse. that straw man there to beat. You know, yeah. they say, oh, look, don't look. That's what they believe. You know, you should be against that. You know, um, but I think that they, uh, so they're in their moment of triumph. Everything seems possible now. Power is in their hands. They can't say there's anything blocking them. They've got the most liberal abortion regime in, uh, in, in Europe they, they, they managed to introduce into Ireland, uh, which means that the, the, the hand in hand with that is, is an understanding that they can introduce the most liberal kind of regime on pretty much anything yeah. that they want. So now let's see them deliver. The next few years, let them see, let them deliver the utopia that they have promised us. Mm. Let, us let them deliver the happiness and the glorious freedom from, from um, medieval Catholic notions that they told us they were going to do. Let them bring us the prosperity and the, and the, the good fortune and the, and the, the equality, good, goodwill, and multicultural <laughs> union, and happiness, and dancing in the streets and rainbows in the sky that they said they were going to. Because now they're in power. I'm sorry, you can't say the bishops are in your way. And 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 I'll be honest with you, the national party isn't in your way yet. So it's all yours to play for, guys. You show us in the next ten years what you can do. And when that 10 years is up, by God, we'll come for you. 
and we'll come for you hard and we'll say where are what where are the things we were promised where are the things that liberalism said yeah. that them to account. We're going to deliver and uh we we'll still have to have a, ma a majority to vote them out at that stage though, in 10 years maybe five years is enough to give them justin <laughs> give them five actually the next election i want to see them gone hopefully well but, i would like to see them gone too but let's not be overconfident and let's plan let's plan because i tell you something is uh, every moment spent on a short term plan uh, is a moment wasted uh, uh, going in the wrong direction, uh, which should have uh, 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 every moment trying to take. If you've ever, <laughs> if anybody's ever suggested to you a shortcut, if you ever down the country and somebody suggests you, oh, no, don't mind that, don't, don't mind, especially don't mind them old Google Maps now. That, that they're all fancy things. If you head across there, I swear to God, you'll be at least three hours longer getting to wherever you want to get. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit like that in politics. Anybody who tr pl promises you a shortcut to Irish freedom and, uh, and to, to a Gaelic revival is, is uh, a snake oil salesman. Selling you a lie, yeah. Um, it's, uh, they, they, they may believe it themselves. They may be genuine. I'm not saying that they, they are themselves uh, uh, corrupt people. They may believe it, but they are wrong. But they are wrong. Uh, I've been a. I'm not an old man yet. I'm still only middle aged, thank God. But uh, but I've been around long enough to see uh, enough promises from people who are going to solve the, uh, Ireland's problems in the next couple of years or in the next three to four years uh, to know that it's a much, much longer road back from how low down we have gone than, than three, four, five years. Uh, maybe in 10, we'll start to see a real recovery. We, we will start to, first of all, we have to get those people who already know what's wrong. We have to get them representation. We have to get them representation. We have to get them uh, uh, their their voices heard. Uh, in, uh, in if their if their voices are heard as elected voices in 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 Doyle Air, then they cannot they cannot be kept off the mainstream media uh, uh, um, uh, anymore because uh, or else all all the mainstream media's credibility falls apart if they're saying oh well he's just a lunatic ah oh, well he happens to be a TD actually <laughs> the people of wherever kill there north or where or, or, you know people of mm -hmm. their constituency they elected him uh so uh he's not you can't keep saying he's fringe you can't keep saying and and he's not the only one of his party and so on and so forth is um we'll we'll see that first and then we'll and then we'll see the criticism that we can make of the system as it progresses the further and further down and um and uh we will see that uh, uh, we will be able to, to, people will be able to go, oh yeah, well that's what Justin Barrett and that National Party said was going to happen. And then it did happen. And it's not to any, per I have no crystal ball. I have no, I'm not engaged in any, any occult practices here. I'm just observing the facts and the inevitable consequences of those facts and saying, look, this is, this is, what, this is what it must lead to. Uh, but a lot of people still have hope in liberalism, and they believe they we we know it. But the vast majority of young people have a great hope that liberalism can still is the answer because the Irish people have not tried liberalism before. Well, they're going to get a good solid dose of it now, and they're not going to like it. Um, and uh, and as I say, um, you know, they call the National Party uh, uh, far right. Well, we've been right so far. Uh, that's the way I put it, and 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 we will continue to try and and be that voice for people until such time as they are ready and willing to turn to us and say, "Okay, we 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 we've we've done liberalism. We've tried. Enough. We've had enough of it. Now, can you put together something coherent as an alternative, uh, 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 as a as a as a government? Um, because if you can." will will elect it and uh, i hope that when that time comes and i believe that it will come that we will be able to say to the irish people yes we can put together a government 
we can put together a government and we can put together a government who can, where, who can cooperate with other nationalist governments throughout uh, the former European Union and um, and and we can work together uh, with them to protect their national interests, not contrary to our own, but in line with our own and 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 in uh, and without conflict with each other. Um, and there's going to be an extra few of those people every year in the or in the next year in the EU. Uh, when you're looking at what's happening in Italy, in Poland, uh, well, the reckon there's going to be a third of the European Parliament will be Eurosceptic. So, although I'd be very, I, I worry about, I worry about over uh, estimating what's going to happen in the European Parliament elections. And the reason why, I, uh, the only reason why I say that is because uh, I don't want people to be disappointed. Again, uh, I, 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 I much prefer to underpromise and overdeliver than than overpromise and underdeliver. Uh, um, I wonder why the media keeps saying that there's going to be a third of the European Parliament um, is going to be Eurosceptic or is going to be nationalist. Yeah, are, are they preparing us for a far um, for it to fall short of that yeah. by by just a small margin? And then say, oh, they're defeated, they're completely yeah. destroyed. Like they said that after Macron as well. They said, yeah, exactly. They said, they said, uh, well, when Marine Le Pen, oh, well, she only got 34% of the vote. Well, wait a minute. Uh, no uh, right wing candidate in France has ever got 34% of the vote before. Uh, well, so, so to, to be proclaiming that to be some kind of a disaster. But the problem that, 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 that they, the Front National had, the problem that Marine Le Pen had, is, is that there was this expectation that she was going to win. And she probably should have dampened down that expectation. She should have probably been saying to people, no, not this time. Um, uh, um, but... There was an expectation there, and then it wasn't realized. And when it wasn't realized, there was a problem. Uh, and a lot of people lost a lot of faith at that point. So I caution people. I say, look, uh, what happens in this, this uh, next May? It's it's what? It's three months away. What happens in local elections? What happens in, in, in the European elections? It does not decide the fate of the rest of European civilization. Calm, calm down. Um, a, uh, a, if it's a good result, it's a good result. If it's a bad result, it's a bad result. But it's not, it's, t it's neither, it's neither, there will be neither total triumph nor total defeat on May the 24th next year. It's a lot longer struggle than that. And if we don't get that, if 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 there isn't a third of the parliament nationalist, um, if it's only a quarter, then a quarter will do. It's and a good start, and we will work from a quarter. And 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 the one thing is, is for the first time in a very long time, internationally speaking, things are going in the right direction rather than the wrong direction. Now we have such a long road to go. We have such a long way to go that it seems very bad. And it seems worse in Ireland because, quite simply, because we haven't gone through the worst of it yet. People, there's still, there's still too much hope uh, invested by ordinary people in, in liberalism. Liberalism, which is, it's, it's kind of weird, is uh, what's called, what, what passes for progressivism in Ireland is, is 1970s ideas. I mean, these are really old ideas that are being packaged and sold to Irish young people as new and brilliant and uh, and never heard of before notions and this is like this is like progressivism this is uh, like the this was considered progressive uh, avant-garde and trendy in uh, in uh, in other countries in in Europe in the 1970s that's that. That's the way in which we are backward. If you want to call Ireland backward, it's that we have embraced liberalism at precisely the time when the rest of the world has said, "Wait a minute, we tried that. That didn't work. We better, we better, 
literally do a U-turn in this car and try and get back as fast as we can. And we're still heading towards where they are going. Yeah, we have to catch up with everybody else. It's what? always the way with Ireland, though, isn't it? We lag behind with all of all the different movements and different like polit politics. This is a perfect example. The fact that it the fact that Irish politics hasn't become ideological already is is in and of itself an in, in, in indicator. Uh, the fact that um, the fact that that people honestly believe. You 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 can say with a straight face, for example, uh, to Irish people that Fine Gael is a right wing party, and they don't <laughs> they don't like you know go. <laughs> you know, I mean, in European terms, uh, uh, Fine Gael would be unelectably far left mm -hmm. in yeah. pretty much any country in in Europe. Pretty much any country in Europe, uh, Fine Gael would be on un an unelectable far left fringe group. Um, and in Eastern Europe, they would say, oh, it's the communists again. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't we, be too wrong either. <laughs> we have them back. They are exactly the same. They know, exact, they know exactly what a communist looks like, whatever he calls himself, because they've seen every shade and type there is. Um, so, um, but in Ireland, where the newspapers casually write about the uh the right wing uh Fine Gael party and uh and uh and the um and the the far left write about the far right Fine Gael party they're chasing shadows constantly well, they're just they're, making up these phantoms and they're, they're pulling them down in their mind you know they have yeah, well they have to uh, I, I i don't know they have to have this imaginary battle because because this is the situation they're in is the situation they're in is they have they have effectively won politically speaking they have all the positions of political power so they should be able to do whatever they want and they should be able to create the utopia that they promised now it suddenly dawned on them is that they do not actually know how to govern they know how to destroy but they don't know how to govern and they don't know how to build and so they are trying to pretend the enemy is still there somehow, uh, lurking uh, 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 and somehow frustrating what would otherwise be fine. But look, that's the situation we find ourselves in. Um, um, we can't, uh, they, this is their moment of triumph. And so therefore it is the moment that, that is bound to look darkest from our point of view. But internationally speaking, things have turned around. And whether whether we whether we are in the death throes of the of the I don't know, Fifth Roman Empire or whatever, I don't know. I can't answer that question because I can you can never be certain. But I am certainly more optimistic than I was in 2006 when I said, look, I'm done with this. This is, this is, I'm just banging my head against the wall here. I do not feel I'm banging my head against the wall uh, anymore. Um, I, I, I feel a resonance out there for what we're saying. And, uh, and I think we, uh, the, the people who are coming to us are saying to us that, yes, we understand that it will not be simple. It will not be easy. It will not be, uh, um, and they're pining, uh, they're pining, as it were, for an island that they never lived in. So yeah. they have no illusions. They have no illusions about how hard it's going to be. Uh, the, all they remember is this place as a cesspit. And all I remember is this as a cesspit. I don't know if there are these older people in their 70s or 80s who remember a glorious Ireland, uh, what's called. Uh, it, it, it's not been in my lifetime, and it's not been in your lifetime. Um, it's a, it's a, it, it's always been a pretty bleak country to live in, and it, and it's getting worse. Um, and the, and the worst part about it is there's so much potential there. There's so there much potential. It is a, it that's, is that's, that's the exact thing that annoys me so much. You hit on it there is that there's, I see this country as having such an incredible potential. The people, the caliber of people that we send abroad. You know, in this un undignified way, and then we have to send the Taoiseach over, you know, to uh, to Washington to beg the Americans to take our people for another couple of years, please. You know, it, it, I I find that shameful. Yeah, um, it is horrendous. It is it is horrendous. It's it's a uh, this um, 
neo-colonialist or post-colonialist. You see, it would be post-colonialist, except we've just adopted a new empire, which is the European Union. So we have this neo-colonialist attitude um, that um, that things that are foreign are better uh, by definition. Um, even though the old phrase, uh, which which like makes me want to throw up, but like for something that's stupid or backward or whatever, I, oh, that's a bit Irish. Hmm. Like, where did we get that? Well, how did we inculcate that into our own heads? Is that uh, is that if that was the definition of 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 backward or stupid or 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 mistaken, was that that was a bit Irish? Um, Maybe it's from the underdog mentality that we always had because of Britain or something, but we need to drop that now. We need to drop it. We need to drop the, and we also need to drop the nationalism. I would say the, the I'll, I'll call it the nationalism of Vakon of you know, of poor yeah. me, uh, what's God, look at what we've been through. I would say, look at, look at the struggle of Irish history and what we've been through, through the lens of what a magnificent people to come through that and still exist, rather than, oh, poor me, uh, what's called, every, the world owes me an apology. Um, the nationalism of victimhood is not the nationalism of the National Party. The nationalism of the National Party is rooted in the dignity of the Irish people and the glorious things that they are capable have shown themselves to be capable of and the dignity in which they have been able to uphold themselves under the worst of circumstances under the worst of circumstances yeah. um and that leads me to a great confidence that uh, what we could do if we had a real free independent and gaelic ireland and a, a real a real republic and i and i as i say i am a republican in in that political ideological sense but more important to me is that the national idea is uh, that ireland not free merely but gaelic as well ireland not gaelic merely but free as well i love that idea i think that's what they're afraid of because just that line tells everybody that the irish people are a distinct ethnic group is what i read out of that and it has to be preserved and that goes against all the tenets of globalization immediately once you say that they don't see an irish people they just see a big green patch that needs to be made more diverse so i think that is the reason that they are afraid of and once you say that to people it, it will reawaken this in them because they know I, a lot of people know that it's it's wrong what's happening they just don't have the words but just in just to move on um people have been asking i i read one of the well, I, I read the articles actually that, that you put out and the, that the website puts out the national party they're always great articles and one of the most recent ones was it's time to register and I know it's a long, it's going to be a long battle. It's not going to be done in one election cycle or anything near that. But um, I, in the article, it says that you needed to get 300 members to put, go forward and to get the party uh, registered. And there's also good reasons why you weren't registered for the past three years. Um, but, and people have been often saying that, well, they're not registered, so they're not serious. But there was actually very good logical reasons that you weren't registered in 2016, 17 or 18. And, and people would just like to know now, did that happen? Or, and or, is that in the process of actually happening now? Uh, the registration of the party is in the process of happening uh, right now. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the extent to which it is in the process of happening is that I check the register of parties every day now at this point to see is our name on the list. It should literally um, go, go. Okay, right. I don't like to, again, I, I say this, don't over promise, right? Uh, uh, but over deliver instead. But within the next two to three, three weeks, I'm confident that unless there is some major uh, intervention by some force that, that, that I can't imagine uh, that the, the National Party will be registered within, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, um, uh, exactly as we planned to do. Um, it was. It wasn't. It there was no. What was the? There had been a general election in two thousand and sixteen. There wasn't going to be a European election or local elections until two thousand and nineteen. Um, what use was registration? 
No. Uh, we had a party uh, uh, that proclaimed itself to be of the nationalist right, which still, technically speaking, pretends to exist. And again, I won't name it. We don't. We we your listeners know who who who, who I'm talking about. Uh, they've been registered quite a long time. Uh, they have. They don't hold any meetings, mind you. They don't have to hand out any leaflets, and they don't have any policies. In fact, they don't even seem to be able to keep on top of having the odd tweet put out there but there you go they're a registered party i have said from the beginning that registration is just acknowledgement by the doll clerk that you're a party uh we will need that for elections yes but until elections are an issue it wasn't it wasn't necessary and it wasn't even useful and we didn't even attempt to get it um but we have, but as I say, the article, as you said, was time to register. I believe it's time to register. I believe it's time for us to prepare for elections. I believe that the National Party is ready, perhaps not to win seats, but certainly to put up a good showing. Mm-hmm. Um, um, uh, and again, maybe not this May, but certainly by the general election, which we expect to, to be next year. Uh, um, but we are ready. Uh, to to test the waters at least to see if there's a resonance among the electorate as there has been a resonance certainly among ordinary people. Um, so we didn't register because there was no point, and and uh, and that should tell some people something about the steady nerve of the National Party. That's what I was thinking. It's, you're you're slow. You're not rushing or anything. Exactly, and we were we were being taunted on social media, and and people were coming to me and saying, "Oh, look, such and such," but and they did they, you know, people who are on social media know who the other people are, even if they are under avatars. I wouldn't. I'm. I'm. I. I, I don't. Uh, I, I apart from Twitter, I more or less stay away from social media. But um, mm. but they'd say such and such is I was on again last night about oh you're not a real party, you're not a registered party, uh, and I'd go well, so what? Um, uh, the 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 plan is the plan that we laid out in two thousand and sixteen, and I'm not changing it in order to satisfy uh, some idiot like on a in a chat. Room mm. last night that we are a real party we, because because if he was going if he or she uh, usually it's a he but if he was directing party policy we'd already be wrapped up and gone home. Um, these people who uh, are constantly comment on the national party should do the national party should do let them just go that just go ahead and do it. If it's so simple, go ahead and do it, because I can tell you it's not. It's quite difficult to do a lot of things. Um, uh, The the delay, other people call it a delay on registration. I think we we are registering precisely at the time we intended to register. We said we wouldn't until 2019, and we haven't until 2019, and we are going to in 2019. Precisely as we as we anticipated, we would do. Um, I can't always say everything will go as smoothly in terms of that, but there are no there were no hiccups uh, with registration. There's the um, it's a sim- simple enough thing to do, uh, so long as you have the members. Uh, getting an active organisation on the ground that's our real work for twenty nine. Getting a common groups around the country, which we are being very successful in doing as well. Um, that's the real work of 2019. Registration is, yeah, we'll get that. That's grand and that's great. Uh, but that, but our real work is 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 creating the the organisational structure that can fight election campaigns and win election campaigns. More important, an awareness that you exist. You have to create that as well. I think because of this censorship. Somebody just said in the chat there, uh, the National Party are created three years, but no one ever heard of them. Well, that's because of the censorship, guys. Um, just let's just address that. That yeah, they they you are can do something heavily. about this. You can, yeah, spread the the website, uh, sh- share the stream and stuff like that and, and get the word out that there is a party that have these principles that are all in the interest of the Irish people. Not one of them deviates from the interests of the Irish people and the nation. Uh, very healthy stuff. I, I cannot fault it in any way, actually. 
Like, well, if, want. if we have a if we have a healthy common structure and a local organizational structure, then we have a campaigning organization, and then you can bypass uh, uh, the the mainstream media. You can you can of course do what we we have been doing to a certain extent, which is the alternative media. But we know that's a, uh, it's limited, but an echo chamber in the sense of it's the like minded people talking to each other uh, to a certain extent. Although that's the first step because like-minded people weren't able to talk to each other they felt extremely isolated not not even may even two two years ago uh even uh, uh like-minded people were isolated from each other but we'll have an organizational structure that can knock on doors that's when the national party will get to be known uh Marion mccallaghan won't introduce justin barr to the irish people i'll introduce myself to the irish people uh, by literally knock on your door hello and and uh and the more they demonize uh all i say about that is the more they demonize they all they do is they lower the bar is uh, uh um i just have to appear without having two heads and and four legs in order to make people think wow he's better than i thought he was gonna be <laughs> the way the media do so occasionally try and paint paint us um but yeah it's, it's a deliberate it's a deliberate policy and it's working and um and and when i hear criticism like that i go is do you understand you're being had you're being because that's what you're meant to do you're meant to write in oh nobody's heard of you you're meant to demoralize people in the national party you're meant to make them feel like they're going nowhere uh because the the mainstream media won't let them go anywhere and that the mainstream media are the gateway to political success um you're 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 doing the work of the enemy if you like by by constantly repeating that uh, what we already know, we know the vast majority of people haven't heard of the National Party. Um, we know that's why it's a long task. We know that working outside of the uh, established channels is not the easy way for political success. Uh, it's not the easy way to get people elected and it's not the easy way uh, but it's the only way to make things change because well, not traditionally but we're, this is new now so we, we don't know what what powers we might have here that we're just not aware of maybe exactly but you know? I tell you one thing if you take the orthodox path you'll end up as an orthodox party and uh, yeah. what's got and we can we can go down that road and we can get media attention and before you know we'll be parroting the same nonsense as leo Radker. only only, only there'll be a, a a different face uh and a different voice but like what difference is it made uh like uh, in the immediate for example at the next general election the speculation is will leo Radker be t-shock or will uh um um michael martin be t-shock or and Simon Coveney, or what's the difference? Coveney, or, or does it matter? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Fine Gael are in government today, supported by Fianna Fáil. Uh, there is a there, there is a very good chance that Fianna Fáil might be in government the next time, supported by Fine Gael. Really, seriously, yeah, we can go down those orthodox channels. We can get very well known very quickly. Um, uh, I guess by playing the game. Uh, the way it's supposed to be played um, and the way it's historically been, been played. And in 10 years' time, we'll be just as corrupt and we'll be just, we'll be just parroting the same nonsense. So we've, just as useless. We've taken the harder road, we've taken the longer road, but we have taken in the, in the long run, um, for example, uh, again, back to the beginning of the interview, we will not abandon the national idea. We will not abandon the national idea, and not for not for uh, airtime on prime time, not for airtime on the nine o'clock news, not for a, a special guest spot on the Mad Cooper show or drive time, uh, or for a front page headline in the Irish Times. We will not abandon the Irish people. We will not abandon the Irish nation. And if we go down with the Irish nation, if that's our fate, then that will be our fate. 
Um, but we won't worry about not being on RT in the meantime. That's not our, that's not our number one priority. Ireland's our number one priority. And that should be the number one priority of anybody who, who is listening to this program uh, or who is, who is listening to the National Party through whatever venue they are, they are, they are listening to us through or wh whatever channel is that um, we will not abandon our principles in order to conform in order to make ourselves more acceptable to the current political establishment. We intend to destroy the current political establishment and every single party that is part of it. Mm. Now, are they going to just roll over and let us do that? No, no they're going to fight back. And they are fighting back. And the first phase of that fight back from their point of view is make sure the message doesn't get out there at all. Make sure. Uh, and, and okay. But I think you need to be appealing to a lot of people as well. As to, I know you don't want to appeal to the establishment or the political classes, but to as many people, people who would be maybe nationalist shoppers who know something's wrong, but they, they don't know anything about a lot of this stuff goes over their heads. But if, I think if they if they understood the national idea, they wouldn't be long about jumping onto the national party. Uh, uh, but but um, yeah, it's 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 very hard when you're being censored. That's the only thing. Um, but yeah, appealing to the most amount of people, I think, is very important. Um, I I said I was going to ask you about one of the principles that I thought it a few people have said it to me. It turns them off a little bit, but it's it's of course and the, and the principle is a great principle. It's the ninth principle about reforming the criminal justice system, which absolutely needs to be done. At Ooh. the moment, our Department of Justice is the Department of Equality and Direct Provision, more or less. Uh, that's what all I see them doing at the moment. But then uh, people say about the death penalty and this could bring us back 100 years and all of this. And, and I often say to people, well, look at America. They do it. And, and you hardly think they're 100 years behind anybody. So, um, And for heinous crimes, it, I agree with the principle. But some people say it's it's off-putting just to see that. Now, that's my only little thing that I have a thing with where, uh, where people have said to me, and where I sometimes agree with them a bit, where, yes, it, I think it should be put into law without a doubt. But um, does it appeal to the most amount of people, that exact principle? I don't know, but okay. it's well, there anyways. Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's, an, uh, there's, there's, there's two ways to answer that question. One is the principled way of answering is it, it's, to, it's there because we believe it. Yeah. Uh, and now that should tell you something. Is, uh, where, uh, is, it, is was, was it the most brilliant PR move to, to place it there? It probably wasn't. But here's the thing, and this is this is this is the uh, essence, uh, if you like, of the of what's different about the National Party is the National Party in government is going to look exactly like the National Party does now, writ large. Uh, you ain't going to get any surprises. You're not going to wake up in the morning after voting for the National Party uh, and find a National Party government that does exactly the opposite of what it said it was going to do. We do intend, uh, uh, it'll be, it will require a referendum, mind you, because it's uh, uh, there's a constitutional prohibition on the death penalty at the moment. But... Uh, um, uh, we do intend to introduce the death penalty for particularly heinous crimes, and 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 let, let, let's think about what they are for a moment, because um, we're talking about um, we're talking about a country that is literally at the moment overrun with with child rapists, for example. Now, if you're telling me that a that 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 a a man who has raped a three year old child has not forfeited his right to life. And that he would not be better at the world would just not be a better place for him being gone out of it. Now, not in prison, but just gone, just obliterated, quite literally. Then I find it very difficult to understand the mindset that can't see that and can't understand that. Mm. Now, I can accept that, oh, well, you shouldn't say it. You should keep it to yourself. Well, then perhaps we should say nothing about immigration as well, because that's an awkward Great point. And maybe we should say nothing about uh, uh, United, United Ireland as well, because that, that brings up. And before you know it, you say nothing about anything, and you start lying. Yeah. 
the same as everybody else. So does the National Party believe, do I personally believe, that the death penalty should be there for particularly heinous crimes? And we're not talking about now not paying your DV license. In fact, that's a virtue. But <laughs> we're, we're talking about um, particularly disgusting and heinous crimes. Yeah, like not, murders and stuff, but, stuff like uh, that, yeah. Murders, and not even, I, 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 would, I would go so far as to say when we talk about murders, we, we would be talking about um, particularly heinous murders too, not, yeah. not, I hate to call it your average murder, but it no. would have to be more than, like, it would have to involve a, a great degree of violence as well. It would have to be um, a, a particularly grievous case. Yeah. And there would have to be a significant fear as well, and this should be taken into account, that that uh, that, that, that person would reoffend. Because the one thing you can be absolutely certain of is that somebody who's received the death penalty will not reoffend. That never has been known to happen. And we don't want them procreating either. Take them out of the gene pool. I agree. If, if somebody's committed, a, I, I agree with the principle. It's, it's not that at all. It's just some people say it can be off putting to normies. That's the only from, thing. From a PR perspective, should we take? Should we not have put it in? Should we have taken it out? Uh, what Scott? That would have been the first line. At least you've been straight. You, people, see, what they see is what they get. That's For the sure. way it, it that is. That would have been the first line. That would have been the first little thing that we just held back because it was politically easier. That's the slippery slope uh, to lying about everything, and then we're, we are, we are we are just Fine Gael, we're just Fianna Fáil, then, and we and we we say whatever we need to say at the doorstep to win a vote. If I have to walk away from the doorstep without a vote because that uh, that person does not support the death penalty, then that's fine. That's what I will have to do. But I believe these nine principles are 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 the the fleshed out I notion of the national idea. They are what is required as uh, uh, to to save the nation uh, um, from from literally from ruination. And if I didn't believe in every one of them, they wouldn't be there. Um, and I'm not going to uh, lie to people, nor am I going to lie by a mission either and hide stuff and say, look, I'll keep this to myself and I'll, I'll, I'll whip it out six months into government. Like, mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. When nobody's watching and when I have no mandate for it. Now, the way the, the, way the system passes do. Yeah. Uh, this is the new politics. And so, yeah, uh, the death penalty is there. Um, um, mm. And the criminal justice reform is there. It's another part of the same principle. It's very yeah. it needs it's, to be done badly. It's not just a death penalty. Is we need we need to have sentencing which focuses on protecting society, yeah. um, uh, and 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 does involve uh, uh, a punishment for criminal activity. Does involve real punishment. And that is not all focused on, oh, if everybody had a nice childhood, they'd never do anything bad. Um, but God, the fact of the matter is, is that in this country, 40, 50 years ago, everybody was near like near starvation level malnutrition uh, in terms of poverty. And the, and the number of murders that took place in this country was negligible. Uh, the amount of crime in this country was relatively negligible. This idea that, 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 that criminals commit crime because of socioeconomic exclusion, frankly, is nonsense. There are, there's such a thing as a bad person. And a bad person uh, needs to be punished and can learn something from a punishment. And um, uh, and the over focus of the modern judicial system, as far as I'm concerned, on a what is a hopeless notion of rehabilitation. This idea that the, a guy is up for his 92nd uh, offence and you're go you're going to rehabilitate him this time, really? Really? I don't think you are. Now, he may not deserve the death penalty, but he deserves to go to prison and he deserves to go there for quite a while. And he deserves for that prison. And I'll tell you this, too. He deserves for that prison to be an unpleasant experience, not yeah. to be the holiday homes that some of them are at the moment. Not to be uh, as 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 the as I heard uh, an actual prison warden uh, quite recently on the radio state is the deprivation of liberty is in and of itself a punishment enough. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it's not. 
when an old person is attacked in their home and robbed uh, uh, of their life savings and perhaps left within an inch of their lives. No, I'm sorry. The deprivation of that man's liberty is not enough no. uh, uh, to protect society. Uh, and he deserves to be punished and he deserves to be punished for a considerably long time. We need some ju we need some judges on the bench with some backbone. And we need and and I will say this quite honestly, we need them sometimes, sometimes to be confronted very rarely. I would say it would happen very rarely, but every so often they're going to be confronted with a situation where the only appropriate thing to do is to say that this person must pay the ultimate penalty because they have committed the ultimate crime yeah. uh, and i'm not going to i'm not going to lie about that for votes i'm not going to lie about anything else for votes uh the one thing that uh uh that, that, that you can call justin barrett a crank but you can't call him a liar mm. uh, and uh that's that uh, that's that's not going to happen no i admire your straightness it's just straightforward and explain exactly you've explained it perfectly there i i think it's uh, I've nothing else to ask about that actually because um, I think we do need it. It's, it was just the PR is all I meant but uh, people should look a little bit further into that and actually go to the website and look at other things apart from just look at the end of uh, principle 9 and write off everything else. No, that is pure stupidity, anyone that does that. But, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I thought you made great points. If principle 9 was the only principle we had then yeah, I get that. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. With the death penalty party, that's it. Uh, mm. what's got, well, we want to show people what, what we are, uh, what, what principle 9 really is about and, and yeah, it goes as far as the death penalty and it does do so. But what it's really about is that we are we are serious about law and order. We are serious about law and order, and we are seriously sick and fed up of the idea that uh, that criminals are not responsible for their crimes, and that they shouldn't be punished for their crimes, and that society doesn't deserve to be protected from those people. Uh, we are that 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 permeates the whole just judicial system in Ireland at the moment, and the whole uh, 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 attitude towards criminality and it leads to more criminals because there's no deterrent a lot of them think of it as a holiday camp especially these uh, people that come in from other nations and other continents they think our criminal justice is a joke yeah absolutely Ab yeah. absolutely and it's the it's the the punishment's no big deal and in any case uh well a large, large to a large extent these come from criminal families where they the first the, it's family members greet them at the door yeah. they, you know quite literally yeah. And so they spend their time in there with like nephews, nieces, uh, uncles, uh, aunts, whatever. Uh, they, they, half their family is, is out of prison, half their family is in prison. Um, it's not, um, we need, we, we need deterrence. We, we're, ma we're making the, 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 the point that we need to restore a law and order and a respect for law and order in this country and that needs to be on two levels uh what uh, that needs we need to restore the uh the integrity of ungardish giacana which has been uh tarnished by uh various scandals that have occurred in the last few years and on the other side we need for for people who are victims of crime to feel that they got justice now um, what justice means in a particular situation is another story. And, uh, and again, on the softer end of it, if you want to go to the softer end of it, is I certainly believe that uh, first offenders, for example, uh, their chances of rehabilitation are, are vastly increased by non-custodial sentences, if at all possible. So that, does that make me a soft liberal on crime? That I say, I, first offenders, I think a custodial sentence should be very rarely applied because that puts them on, on, a, on a conveyor belt to crime after crime after crime. It does. So, the uh, media never say you said that, though. Yeah. yeah, they won't say I said that. No. Uh, so, but what I would say is, uh, like, where the rehabilitation is possible, uh, then rehabilitation should be done. But that's at the beginning. 
But when you get this guy up for like, uh, as I say, his 91st defense, uh, going light on him at that point is not going to turn his life around. But when you get somebody up, say, for their first defense, um, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's reasonably serious, shall we say, but it's not like, you know, it's not violent crime, say, it, um, you know, it's, uh, 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 they, and there is a good chance that by being lenient on them, you don't set them on a life of crime. Then, then we should have the with judges on the bench who who can discern that. Uh, I don't like mandatory sentencing, for example, because it removes. Uh, it's considered a very right wing thing to say. Is uh, oh yeah, mandatory sentencing, ten years for whatever offence, no matter what. But that removes from the judge lo looking down from the bench at an actual human individual to judge whether if I go easy on this guy, will he be able to turn his life around or her life around, for that matter? Uh, or, or, or are they on an inevitable road uh, uh, down downhill anyway? And, and society just needs to be protected from the get-go. Um, so I don't like mandatory sentencing. I, I, I detest the idea that, that, ju that judges are restricted from being lenient uh, in the same way as I detest the idea that judges are, re are restricted from being harsh. Sometimes harsh is what was required and sometimes lenient is what is required. But back to the national idea, what's good for Ireland, what's good for society, what's, uh, what's good for um, law and order, what protects ordinary people and what, what allows them to go about their lives in a degree of peace and freedom. And freedom is not just a political freedom or freedom of speech. If you if you're if you're an older person, particularly, and and you go to bed at night frightened every night, that is not freedom. That is not freedom. And uh, and they, they they those people deserve that freedom. They deserve the security uh, uh, of the knowledge that they that they can go to bed at night safely and that they will get up in the morning safely again. It's not too much to ask for the people in the last years of their lives who have who have uh, like contributed to the system. And again, back to the fundamental who are one of us. Yeah. Who are at the end of the day one of us, and so are the bloody criminals as well. Is uh, what's caught, and um, and when they behave wrongly, is uh, if they if they were your brother or they were your cousin, you give them a good whack around the head, right? Well, judicially speaking, uh, what we we should be prepared to do the same is uh, what's caught is uh, uh, for their own good as uh, as much as anybody else's. Sometimes is to put them on the straight and narrow, but cruel to be kind. Group, anyway. uh, well, I wouldn't even say cruel. To be no, kind. that's a bit uh, extreme. Uh, just to be, just to be uh, uh, kind. Um, yes. Real justice, proper justice, and uh, and sometimes justice has to be very extreme. But sometimes the crime is very extreme, and uh, and there is a reason why the death penalty is there for heinous crimes, not just. It doesn't say for some crimes or for or that it should be in some case. It's very specific that it must be a particularly heinous crime before you would, because it is an extreme thing to do. I do not take human life lightly, and I do not take the idea that the that the judicial system should take a a, a, a human life uh, 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 lightly either. But for the protection of society. For deterrence of of of, uh, of offences and for uh, and and preventing reoffending, sometimes a a crime is so heinous and so awful mm. that there is nothing else for it. And mm. and like said, this hum human took said this human took two or three other humans' lives. Well, then he well, doesn't have the right to do that either. So yeah, it comes back to that. That I came across uh, what's card which shocked me to my to my very core was uh, that a father, uh, and you'll have all have read in the newspapers, uh, um, the, the six-month-old baby wouldn't stop crying. So he kept stuffing tissue paper down the baby's throat until obviously he stopped crying because he stopped breathing. Now, uh, what are you to do with somebody like that? What are you to do with somebody like that? And they say, "Oh well, uh, 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 lock him up and throw away the key." Uh, that never—that's never what actually happens. 
that's never what actually happens. They all, they always, get, they always end up getting out. Um, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, a, a so, waste of oxygen, someone like that, yeah, in my opinion. Well, they, yeah, exactly. So the the defense against the death penalty there is, oh well, so what he did wasn't that bad. Because that's what you're actually saying. Is if you're saying uh, that that he doesn't deserve the death penalty, what you're actually saying is, look, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe he changed his ways since then, or something like that. But yeah, no, it, when you've done such a heinous thing, it doesn't really matter. There, there's no. There's no. Nothing for a person like that, really, no. other than humanity can do without them. Literally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What? I and agree it, with it. And if you're a person of religious faith, let's send them to God and God will decide on the, on the ultimate uh, judgment. If you're not a person of religious faith, well, we, we, we've pretty much sorted it out anyway, yeah. uh, right, right here on earth. Um, so, uh, no, I won't pull punches for PR reasons. Uh, um, That's good. And that will, cost, that will cost votes by time and maybe slow us down a bit. But it makes for a more solid uh, uh, scenario in the long run. And it also means that, for example, uh, that, that people joining the party, say, in 2019, do not find that 20 years down the line, after making 20 years of sacrifices to get this party into power, that suddenly they get something completely different than what they worked for and what they voted for. Um, they can trust us because we are willing to say the unpopular thing uh, uh, or the, the 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 thing that's not necessarily the vote winner, but needs uh, to be said. If it's true. Mm. If it's true, our measure of everything is is if it's true or false. If it's false, we won't say it no matter what we are promised uh, in return for saying it. If it's true, we'll say it no matter what the cost of ha of saying it. And uh, and that is the National Party. That That's the way we will do politics. We will do politics in a way that certainly it hasn't been done in this country before. Uh, it probably hasn't been done uh, in any country for at least three of to 400 years. No, and still they talk about transparency. We're going to be more transparent, transparent, Michal Martin. If this is true transparency. I, I think this, uh, the way you've laid out exactly what your intentions are. And the exactly I, I i think it's it's very good people should look into it but um no i let don I ask you a question now because i i i have um gone through most of mine um i, I thought it was a very good stream lads excellent actually thank 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 you absolutely no i think we have we've enough ground cover we've an awful lot of we've a very long stream there and uh i think people are enjoying it um i won't delay you anymore um, i want to thank you very much uh for coming on here and uh and having the conversation with us, I thought this was one of our best streams. To be honest, I thought it was really, really nice flow to it, and um, I'm sure we'd have you on again sometime anyway. So, well, thank you very much, and it was a pleasure to pleasure to talk to you, and a pleasure to have access to your audience. Thank you. We'd love to have you on again, Justin, for definite. Um, thank you on either of our channels. Um, somebody asked, "Are you going to run a, a candidates in the elections?" But yeah, you've already went through that. So, guys, just watch the stream from the start, and you will get answers to a lot of your questions there. And yeah, maybe we will call it a night for now. What do you think, lads? Yeah. Think okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much for coming on, Justin, and for giving us your time. Thanks to everybody in the audience for uh, watching, guys, and we will talk to you soon. And thanks very much to the Don as well for coming on. And uh, we'll leave her there for tonight, guys. Talk to you soon. Good night.